preface to man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson preface ten years ago a book on broadland would have needed a lengthy introduction the likeness of its spreading lagoons their whereabouts attractions and delights would have required treatment in detail to have become intelligible to many who live outside the county that boasts their possession now everyone knows them many by a personal inspection most by repute in summer crowds of yachting folk and excursionists by rail steamer and road visit these reed surrounded coot haunted waters but to know them thoroughly is to visit them at every season of the year a privilege beyond the means or possibilities of all save the favoured few who live upon the spot man and nature on the broads will undoubtedly prove interesting to both those who know them and those who would like to and as it is the first venture which has professed to give anything like an all the year round glimpse of its people and bird life and general aspects it may be equally acceptable the advance of education an altered state of agriculture and several other causes operating such as will be further commented upon in some of the chapters have materially altered the personnel of the inhabitants their ways and customs and methods of life some like the birds have become rara aves and will probably as individuals become extinct as some avine species have also become the experiences and opinions of a few of these nearly obsolete characters will be found in man and nature arthur patterson great yarmouth october eighteen ninety five end of preface chapter one of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain january in broadland he rises early and he late takes rest and sails intrepid o'er the watery waste waits the return of shot sail on the lake and listens to the wild fowl's distant quack at dusk steers homeward with a plenteous freight from life of a fenman seventeen seventy one the fame of the broads of norfolk has become world wide books in plenty have been written in praise and descriptive of them and folk of other nations besides our own upon them have pleasured and browned and become familiar with their spreading waters our introduction therefore need be but brief take a map of norfolk draw a triangle on its eastern side with sea palling at its apex with norwich on the left and yarmouth at its right and you will include in its area of some two hundred and fifty square miles the greater portion of these five thousand acres of charming lagoons and some two hundred miles of navigable waterways they have a beauty peculiarly their own to enjoy which to the full one must needs get under canvas and cruise here and there in the most leisurely fashion for broadland is not a land of worry or bustle but one of dreams and delightful lotus-eating he who in his trim yacht glides through the narrow channels which connect these quiet lakes will find a certain sameness about their characteristic points which is rather refreshing than otherwise 
an effect quite different from that produced by the repetition of many other scenes and our treatment of an individual broad will suffice for a description of them all broadland offers to all its patrons something that will make their holiday jaunt pleasurable even in remembrance the angler finds its waters teeming with hungry denizens to the yachtsman it offers advantages unparalleled in the kingdom the artist who loves the picturesque finds in it an el dorado the archaeologist the botanist and the entomologist will find plenty to see and do whilst the admirer of things ornithological may travel far and wide in search of a happier hunting ground to the strong the broad district is exhilarating and to the weakly health-giving and he who wants for nothing save perfect rest and quietude may here idle away the longest summer's day in perfect happiness undisturbed by the jostling of his fellows or the costliness of his well-earned holiday the air is dry and bracing the annual rainfall is below many other districts in the kingdom the broadland native is a hardy docile being with a tawny sun-scorched beard a fair skin and a ruddy complexion a nose that savours of the aquiline and mild blue eyes with norse or danish blood in his veins mixed with a dash of saxon his vocabulary is limited but his tongue is easy going and lets fly a strange jargon spiced with stray danish derivatives and a host of curious accents let us hie away then into broadland taking our first glimpse and impressions with the new year's advent when the cold north winds whirl the plumy snowflakes hither and thither and the leafless reed stems rustle strange music as the gusts of winter sway them to and fro and the erstwhile tranquil waters of the broad are flinging foam-tipped waves into their midst or maybe when the merry skaters glide to and fro upon its glassy surface and the starving coot at his wit's end has flown to the nearest estuary in search of needful sustenance today we have found its waters locked quietly in the embrace of the frost sprite snowflakes are falling and eddying around us in the keen bustling wind the thermometer is still descending to the delight of many who will be shortly speeding hither from the town to whirl with the lively throng on iron-shod feet we have our skates with us and being assured by a passing rustic that you don't need a fair bore for it's frizz hard enough to bear a dicky we sit down upon the stubbly broad margin and adjust our skeets as the communicative native terms them a few rather awkward movements for it is long since we tried them put us at our ease and we launch out upon the transparent surface at this moment an individual with a parsonical appearance glides swiftly round a reedy promontory merrily salutes us takes a right turn and hies away as on wings of wind reassured we strike out boldly and are soon rapidly gliding in the direction he has taken how bare is the broad margin of vegetation nothing remains now of the broad-leaved water-lilies whose snow-white petals last summer formed such a delightful foreground to the phalanx of emerald green reeds and the taller bulrushes whose big brown pokers flung their shadows over them into the limpid waters where the lilies rested 
the yellow iris has left nothing but its brown broken stubble upon the once time boggy but now hard frozen rond where the alders in the background point upwards their leafless twigs see there are several coltits busily hunting in the stunted branches in search of such larvae or little insects as may have hidden in the bark chinks for a winter's nap what nimble bird acrobats they are now hanging topsy-turvy now running head downwards as the humour or occasion prompts them it is small matter to them in what position they hunt their sleeping prey high overhead passes a harrier of some kind he is a harrywood in the birdland observe yonder tiny red-brown birdies busy among those plumy reed tops they are the bearded tits or reed pheasants of the norfolk natives hardly they must fare now the aphids and dipterous insects are dead or hibernating in more protected locations and the tiny mollusks that crawled up the verdant rush stems are in safe hiding in the depths below they are glad now to glean the seeds of the withering broad vegetation among whose leafy recesses they were cradled let us hope jack frost may deal gently and that the evil eye of the skulking gunner may not glance down sights at them many familiar birds we miss altogether the rails and moorhens have sought the sheltered ditches and the great crested grebes have gone south for the winter for what good were it to stay when the little fry have sought the deepest recesses of the broad and the ice-bound surface forbids them diving in search of them the coots held back until well nigh starved hoping against hope for a break in the long continued frost they too have departed but are content to pick up a scanty living in the salt waters of the tidal estuary persecuted alas at every turn by the merciless gun of the wild fowler the summer birds of passage are almost forgotten we dream not of meeting with the swallows the reed warblers or the cuckoo they are happy among the insect legions swarming by the lakesides of a warmer continent the snow has ceased a while and the sun breaking out smiles down upon a landscape of unsullied white which sparkles with the frost dust crystals yon fenman's cottage cosily nestled amid those stunted willows and the quaint little pump mill close beside it form an interesting break in the uniformity of the broad surroundings a skein of wild geese in wedge form passes overhead a puff of smoke and the report of a gun tell us other eyes beside our own have observed them but they flew far too high for the leaden messengers to reach them the fenman's dinner to-day will be gooseless a flock of wild ducks dash past us on noisy pinions a squadron of melancholy rooks are fruitlessly grubbing in the distant field and the flapping of wood pigeons falls ever and anon upon the ear only one species of bird appears really contented and that is the hooded crow what cares he if hard times cause his fellows to perish for does he not thrive upon the carcasses of the fallen while dashing to and fro the time speeds merrily on and pleasant company for others the parson among them have joined us makes it glide by imperceptibly we tire at length and make again for the edge of the older car whence we started meanwhile the storm clouds have been piling up in the heavens and snow begins to fall heavily ere long hiding everything but the nearest objects from view 
and these are partially covered with the soft pure mantle of winter it is still midwinter and cold but a thaw has suddenly set in it is sloppy underfoot nature has assumed a gloomier outlook and everything but the birds appears dull they poor rogues are glad of a respite for the softened earth will yield them their meat once more the snipe has again made his appearance and is probing in the unlocked ooze for worms and buried larvae the chaffinches are searching in the cultivated patch for uncovered seeds the lapwings in the lowlands are eyeing each likely worm cast and the meadow pipit is closely scanning the weedy debris by the ditch side we have been wending our way down from the deserted little broadland railway station where the solitary porter seemed loth to drag himself from the cheery fire in his cabin of an office a redbreast jauntily chinked us good day from an elevated position upon the great white crossing gate and a couple of hungry sparrows fell to fighting on the metals over a breadcrumb dropped from a carriage window they really appeared to enjoy a breakfast all the better for a preliminary scrimmage as we pass along between the tall hawthorn hedges red wings reluctantly leave their feasting upon the lessening berries now a blackbird and now a fieldfare takes to startled flight from the rootlets below where dormant snails were being eagerly searched for a woodcock overtops one hedge and disappears behind the one on the other side of the road here we are again by the broadside according to appointment and here is our friend the skating parson clad from top to toe in wildfowler's attire and but for that intellectual face you might for all the world take him for a fenman he is none of your namby-pamby individuals who portray life as a perpetual season of psalm singing and breast smiting why we need remain miserable sinners he is at a loss to know but whilst he lures to brighter worlds and leads the way he believes in securing all the enjoyment in the present world possible so long as such pursuit is in accord with sound judgment and bible truths forsooth he is a sportsman and is well able to handle a gun and scull a punt he is muffled up in costumes suited to the season and the errand on which we are going our invite to join him dates back to that frosty morning skating his roomy punt wherein is fastened by a knee a huge gun lies beside the puny bridge which spans a neck of the broad that communicates with another all aboard his man a splendid specimen of the hardy fenman pushes us off and heedless of the bubble-crested waves churned up by the rough wind upon the dark waters of the broad made darker still by the clouds above head we are pulled across it a bunch of wild fowl are disporting themselves in the chilly waters while a few of their number are preening their feathers upon the jagged ice held as at anchorage by the reed stems silently and motionless we now crouch in the boat the fenman who has quietly glided into the stern sculls her forward with a single oar whilst the parson on his elbows and knees places his finger upon the trigger of the gun peering over the boat's rail we observe that the ducks are becoming alarmed and are gathering into a more compact body and those that were on the ice have slid down and joined their companions with a splash and a whirr the startled birds take to wing we momentarily imagine that our host does not intend to fire at them but we are mistaken 
it is the moment he has awaited when the crowding birds shall close up and rise in a body from the water with a tremendous roar and a recoil which throws us flat upon our face the gun belches forth its death-dealing contents the parson has made a bag as the smoke clears off and our boatman eagerly pushes us forward several dead forms are seen floating upon the surface a wounded bird or two are stopped short in their efforts to reach the reedy shelter by the shoulder gun of the clerical sportsman nine widgeon a couple of mallard and a golden eye are the result of our shot the survivors have flown away seaward whilst our man is reloading our ecclesiastical friend evidently much elated by his success waxes chatty it is a matter for regret says he that the birds of broadland have of late years become scarcer our looking at the victims in the boat draws forth a curious smile on his rubicund face ah he added you think such sharp practice as this has had something to do with the decrease of our avi fauna and perhaps it has but it is not the gun altogether which has slaughtered off the birds but the drainage of the lowlands the cultivation of waste places and the consequent dearth of suitable food and shelter or lay as the rustics term it that have more effectually driven them away before steam mills had usurped the clanking pump mills surplus water accumulated in the lowlands and legions of wild fowl swarmed the marshes the birds fed and frolicked in comparative safety and in positive plenty and although great numbers were slain they were but a small percentage of those that remained cattle and corn and root crops usurped the places where the duck once swam in the puddles and the wading bird probed in the shallows the ruff and reeve and the bittern which in my father's time were numerous are rare hereabouts to-day the dastardly egger has done much to aggravate the situation where the gun has slain its units the egger has annihilated a legion but his day too is past for he has destroyed his own ill-favoured craft the lapwing has been fairly ousted by him and then the privacy of some birds in the breeding season has been of late years intruded upon by the prying tourist who in every case is not content with seeing but must handle i believe also in transmitted instinct we get fewer birds now for generations of disappointment have taught the species to keep away from where they'd starve can i justify my action most decidedly these birds which lie dead here are foreign bred they came a mere sample of the hosts bred in the morasses of the north their demise but little if anything at all affects the race they are sent us as food the author of our being and theirs placed us in dominion over the fowls of the air as well as of the fishes of the sea you don't blame a fisherman for taking the life of a herring and why blame me many of my parishioners are glad of a wholesome dinner and these will fall to their share and it's no use hiding the fact i love the sport cruel as i know you esteem it and then a country parson's life is rather a monotonous affair and anything that one can conscientiously admit to alleviate or vary it is worth the letting in visit my parishioners well i do my share at that but lie low 
a parcel of swans wheeling aloft has caught his keen quick eye and we lie low to make ready a warm welcome for them but their eyes are sharper than our own and they fly away to a safer neighbourhood space forbids our entering into all the details of our sport and confabulation shortly let us say we have not another shot after an hour's rest and warm by the parsonage fireside and a glance at his splendid collection of representative local birds all fallen to his own gun we bid him adieu having as our share a couple of wild fowl affording another illustration of kelper's lines as we share in the plunder but pity the birds end of chapter one Chapter Two of Man and Nature on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. February in Broadland. At dusk steers homeward with a plenteous freight. The crazy vessel groans beneath the weight. A tidy housewife waits his coming home, gets dry apparel and cleans up her room and spreads a homely plenty o'er his board from life of a fenman seventeen seventy one the countryside has assumed a bleak and dreary aspect the snows of january have given way before the drizzly rainfall as our train rattles along through the barren fields which lie on either side our route and spread away to the distant woodland or are lost in the horizon we cannot fail to notice the barrenness which characterises the environs of broadland in the month of february fieldike here and there farmer giles or his neighbours have fastened an unwilling team to the plough for it is time the peas and beans were sown the horses are somewhat restive their spell of idleness that has made them impatient of restraint is ended and hard work lies before them contented hodge has been dressing and repairing the hedges and lopping the willows and poplars their shorn limbs lie alongside the hawthorns in one field a number of graceful white birds are eagerly following the plough we have time just sufficient to identify them as the train shoots into and through a belt of fir trees and the little broadland station looms into view they are sea birds and none other than the black-headed gulls larus ridibundus whose nests will be found in the early summer upon the swampy rons that margin some of the broads food has been scarce of late and a meal of fat red earthworms becomes a feast as well as a luxury we have travelled in pleasant company a brace of well-clad fishermen armed with the insignia of their craft are bent on trying the case of angler versus Aesox lucius for the freshwater shark of our reedy lagoons has yielded to the cravings of hunger and come out from his lair in the reed bed in search of small fry for breakfast as we trudge along by the naked hedgerows there is no lack of pleasant chat the broadland angler is more than half a naturalist and there is much that calls for remark when more than one pair of eyes are keenly alert to the sights and sounds which continuously present themselves even at so gloomy a season greenfinches in small flocks fly hurriedly overhead whistling noisy protests against meddlesome husbandmen whose radish beds they have been too busily gleaning in 
a couple of red-faced goldfinches are tamely pecking at an almost seedless thistle tuft we pass them at very close quarters who but the heartless bird catcher could begrudge them their freedom he is as sorry as we are at their perceptible decrease in the country but his is a fox's grief we'll bid you good day for the present is the parting salute of one of our impatient friends you can mardle with the cadders and ring doors bore but we hain't got no time to dawdle so we'll just gee you the seal of the day and be a movin jibes in angler number two with a merry laugh as he good-temperedly wraps up his impatience in a bit of broad norfolk lingo left to ourselves we saunter on yet more leisurely so many interesting tit-bits are turning up on every side now we peer through the hedge at some starlings foraging upon a manure-strewn field what can it be that so absorbs their attentions we clamber over the rickety gate to satisfy our curiosity scattering the much surprised squabblers who make for the nearest trees to watch our strange procedure and await our departure we find quite a host of brandlings which unsavoury though they be have gladly been found by the speckled stairs the earthworms have become cognizant of the slight change in the atmosphere and are working upwards the moles have followed them and are making the path side hillocky with their landmarks some remnants of snow soiled and melting lie piled beneath the hedgerow where the rough winds but recently drifted it a pale yellow primrose has ventured to open its delicate petals and close beside it the young leaves of the coltsfoot appearing above the withered grass bents that the rains and snows of winter have levelled the hazel on our right is already pushing its catkins out from their winter hiding places the loud retort of a gun in an adjacent market garden startles us as it does a number of little birds that dash over the hedge in precipitate flight one of them vainly striving to keep up with the others staggers in its flight and falls to the earth which it reddens with its life's blood a slight flutter and the poor birdie is dead it is a bullfinch peering through the hawthorns we find the gardener picking up two or three other victims and apparently well satisfied with the accuracy of his aim blood ulf as the bird is named in norfolk is no favourite visitant to the orchard just now for the plum and cherry and even the gooseberry buds are set upon by those hard destructive mandibles they say the good he does in other seasons is counterbalanced by the mischief he commits in winter a statement that is very much open to question watch that grey bird with black wings and tail and a dash of sable hue beneath the eyes but he is watching us and takes to wing disappearing in the orchard it is a great grey shrike or butcher bird lanius excubita the sentinel butcher as his latin cognomen denotes is expressive of his habits and his occupation here is a poor little wren he has impaled upon a thorn we have disturbed him at his repast hearken to the tapping of the woodpecker but we may not loiter to discover him the rooks cawing noisily overhead are evidently commencing nesting operations what an uproar to be sure the red wings and field fares busy still among the hawthorns and their cousins the blackbirds and thrushes amongst the roots below are passed unheeded by as are the missile thrushes already nest building in the topmost branches of an old pear tree 
we loiter just a moment when passing a keeper's lodge with its interesting surroundings yon outhouse door is his museum on it are nailed many a real and supposed foe and depredator from the marauding tabby cat to the harmless kestrel at whose hands or rather claws and mandibles his precious pheasants may or may not have suffered surely those barn owls could never have conceived a thought of molestation the rats on which with field mice they almost exclusively preyed have done more to merit vengeance than all the victims hung beside the really useful night birds the marsh harrier circus aeruginosus preferring vermin to all else may have cast longing eyes upon the warren when hard pinched but the keeper imagined him dangerous to his interests and on the supposition condemned and executed him hither comes the gamekeeper a rather uncompromising looking fellow with a ferret in each hand and a brace of vicious curs at his heels the rats have exhausted his patience they have been woefully on the increase and small wonder when their natural enemies have been so ruthlessly and stupidly destroyed here we are at length at the broad margin yonder are our angler friends busy it is evident our glasses revealing them tackling a reluctant pike close at hand are several ducks and swans probing the soft mud of the shallow deke or boat sluice that is connected with the broad they are seeking mollusca and edible roots the fenman has thrown in some maize of which they leisurely partake how broken and colourless the sedges and stubble of other broad plants and how bare are the straw-coloured reed stems of foliage what of it remains is sere and drooping we hear the calling of the moorhens and at the farthest extremity of the reed patch a dusky coot is cautiously paddling out into the open some wood pigeons fly overhead a flight of lapwings is discerned and a small flock or two of wildfowl are making large circles high in the air hard by lies an old wherry it has been heeled over by the boat builder to get at some faulty timbers beyond this characteristic craft of broadland waters is an old drainage mill close by which nestling among some willows is the fenman's cottage whither we are wending our footsteps a devious pathway flanked on either side by a narrow lane of water leads us to it let us step in for we are not strangers here the good old lady whose deafness is to blame for not answering to our knock bids us a cheery welcome she has just spread the table against the old man's homecoming. Jim Tretts out hind the reed cutting, says his loving spouse. But he'll soon come in, bo. Sit ye down, for he's pretty regular to his miles, bo, I can tell ye. Whilst the good woman is finishing her preparations for the noonday meal, we have a look round, taking stock of the room and its contents the whitewashed walls are hung with several common prints of scriptural or sporting subjects a tiny looking-glass overtops the mantel in company with a faded sampler worked by the lady of the household when at school a couple of cheerful linnets hang on either side of the window in the tiniest of cages and beneath them are several geraniums struggling hard to brave the winter and so far they have been successful an aged cat upon the elbow of the old man's chair sits blinking at the fluttering birdies thinking no doubt of times gone by when she was wont to hunt their fellows a few oddments in the shape of wearing apparel 
lines a bird net and an ancient flintlock gun long past service complete the furniture in suspension with the exception of a quaint old timepiece that swings its bright brazen pendulum as methodically and untiringly as it did when the good old folks were novices at housekeeping fifty years ago three or four birch chairs a side table overcrowded with household treasures a dilapidated bureau that contains the rest with a study table creaking beneath the plentiful repast comprise the furniture of below stairs everything even the very brick floor is as clean as scarring soap and elbow grease can make it the old lady's snow-white cap encircles a face upon which simplicity and good nature are finely blended amid the wrinkles of advancing years we have no time for further survey ere a heavy footstep announces the arrival of jem the fenman who enters with scant ceremony his boat lies moored close by the house stacked with freshly cut reeds we are soon seated around the table quite at home and on the best of terms what pleasant gossip makes the meal a luxury of itself it is one for our viands are not unsavoury or badly brought to table who could say nay to a leg of plump wild rabbit snared in the little garden patch outside or to tender lapwing shot but the day before upon the marshes did we like a piece of boiled pike and potatoes or a plate of potted eels did we not and didn't we just enjoy a nice little cut from the wild goose's breast and that wind up with the richest of homemade bread with a bit of cheese such as you seldom find better out of the county rather but that goose it was a pink-footed fellow and sir bracky Reinkus, so we told our host who not having shot the like before so he said had saved the feet for identification he was gormed like ham peggotty if he could spake them hard words at all and good eating the goose was too and the tea wasn't bad which washed down this strange broadland repast as for jim a huge dumpling packed full of starlings formed the principal item on his bill of fare and the old fellow with his tousled hair his unkempt beard and ruddy complexion appeared to thrive on his homely fare and his outdoor life in the strong pure air of east anglia and how does the fenman pass his time through each succeeding season let jim tell us for he has settled to his after-meal pipe and has waxed chatty and communicative as the smoke curls upward well you see it's like this boar there's allers suffin to do be the days long or short and be they hot or cold start from to-day if you like i'm sloggin hard in among the reeds just now and have been off and on since christmas when the weather ha let me what do they do with the reeds why use em for thatchin mostly years ago afore laths was riv and sold for plasterin we used to make a better figure on em than we do to-day lor times ain't no ways like as they was long years ago everything has changed and for the wuss at least for us fenmen we ain't fenmen now but simply labourers time was when we could get our livin and that's fifty year ago and more on and out of the broad alone there was allers suffin in the fishin or shootin line to do nowadays it's reed cuttin in winter mixin it off with a little eel pickin or eel spearin when the weather's open 
then comes ditchin and hedgin in june there's hazel or hay harvest for which we get pay according to day or acre or loads just as we agree for then there's glad and cuttin for litter that's the rough marshy stuff mixed with young sedges reeds and so on later on comes harvest get that over and we go out of the eels again among which we sometimes do pretty good business babbin for em catchin em in bigger numbers as the time goes on in eel sets when they begin to run or make for the sea now and again a job's to be had a rowin gents out a pikin or helpin em in the warmer weather among the roach and bream taking all these things into consideration with ketchin moles and havin an eye to the cattle on the marshes and another on the old pump mills time gets filled in all year round there's a pig in the sty to help with the rent eggs from the chickens ain't all loss and gatherin mushrooms pays for backer this ain't bad backer you have got here sir no how times is altered i was tellin you why when i were a boy and the broads were freer than they are to-day and there weren't no close seasons for birds and there was birds then let me tell you i ha know my father to kill twenty mallard and duck in a mornin there was ruffs and reeves as used to nest hereabouts these we snared and allers had a riddy market for em plovers eggs could be gathered by the peck that's all done with a hatful takes a mornin now to git where are the bards gone why there ain't the bards there was do it stand to reason there can be when in eighteen twenty one my dad took a hundred and sixty dozen eggs in one season and that was only a sample of plenty more these eggs let me tell you was reeves snipes peewits red legs or red shanks and a fair dose of coots and moorhens mixed in among em in course they killed the goose as lays the golden eggs so to speak but there ain't the accommodation for the bards bore now if they'd come for everywhere's all drained and cultivated in winter my father could pretty well keep us with the fowl he knocked over with that old flintlock and the vegetables as he'd grown in the garden patch i get a few birds as you'll see but it's a sort of favour as i'm allowed to shoot for that sort of thing's done for pretty well among us fenfolk there's licences to git and the rich uns ha got it all their own way and on the broads the rights of owners so called are more enforced dinner over we make for the broad taking a peep at the outhouse on our way wherein are stored his various scythes his reed hooks traps and other implements herein the fowls all roost at night and drop in at leisure in the daytime as occasion for laying prompts them the pig hard by gives a squeal of recognition and the ferrets in the corner rattle at the wires for a rat for dinner we shove off from the little stave he to resume his business among the reeds our purpose being a row round upon the silent waters we leave him pushing his old punt into the crackling mass his hands encased in dannocks or leather gloves sickle in one and reed hook in the other with this latter instrument he brings to book the straggling stems we have a peep into the pike fisher's boat they have secured some half a dozen fish one huge fellow weighing at least a stone gulls are winging to and fro over the dark waters picking up here and there some defunct fish two are quarrelling over a dead eel that the recent frosts have killed 
a sclavonian grebe is dipping here and there in the now rippling waters for the winds are stirring and sending up the promise of more rain a flock of widgeon wheel round and round overhead and finally descend dashing themselves upon the surface with the impetuosity peculiar to the race but time is going and great raindrops are making concentric circles upon the broad we row for the fenman's cottage arriving at the mooring stage simultaneously with the good man himself a flock of lapwings are beating up against the wind within gunshot the old man snatches up his muzzle loader which lies in the boat and brings down a trio of the unfortunate plovers after another cup of tea and another interesting chat we take our leave hoping to revisit broadland in the blustering month of march End of chapter two chapter three of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain march in broadland let me live harmlessly and near the reedy brink of broadland waters have a neat thatched dwelling place where i may see my dancing quill or cork down sink with eager bite of bold bright perch or rudd or dace adapted from walton spring is now but a short way off us and between the bursts of wintry weather which the storm king flings over the face of nature she essays to put on a cheery smile in one of these sunnier moods of nature we are tempted to venture broadwards for a turn amongst the perch for our lines and rods have been idle these many months and perch are becoming hungry lobworms have been difficult to procure but patient searching has not been unrewarded angling in my judgment says old isaac deserves to be commended naively adding in effect that there are no practices that deserve commendation but may be justified sir henry wootton one of walton's piscatorial friends used to tell him angling was after tedious study a rest to the mind a cheerer of his spirits a diversion of sadness a calmer of unquiet thoughts a moderator of passions a procurer of contentedness and that it begot habits of peace and patience in those that practised it but contemplation may do for warmer days when sport is uncertain action and brisk sport are necessary to proper enjoyment in the chillier days of march there is pleasure in preparation and in the very anticipation of it we are in a very short time whirled from the busy town into the heart of broadland we noted little difference in the fields and market gardens through which we were hurried certainly the farm labourers seemed somewhat busier than in february for the sowing of oats and barley is claiming the attention of the farmer the strange antics of a lad in one field did attract our notice but we were beyond him ere we could make much out of him it was evident the proceedings of a crowd of great birds that blackened the field were not to his satisfaction and to frighten these away was undoubtedly his intent as we wend our way through a lane we witness the self-same thing repeated and upon the light wind is born a noisy clapping sound and the words of a strange weird ditty cadders and crows take care of your toes for here come the clappers to knock you down backwards so hello cowoo 
it may be that the sable birds are laying claim to a few of the seeds that fell by the wayside as their ancestors did in the days when the god-man taught the people in parables christ was a keen observer of bird life and who can say that he did not teach many a lesson from their ways and doings that are not recorded in the book seeing us lagging by the gateway the crow boy sidles up and wishes us the seal of the day accompanying a rough clumsy bow with a good-humoured grin with an eye open to a large s the norfolk equivalent to the eastern bakshish he allows us to examine the grotesque implement which is supposed to put terror into the hearts of the so-called crows which are in reality nothing more than harmless grub-eating rooks we find it constructed of three pieces of thin wood oblong in shape the centre one being lengthened into a handle the two outer pieces are loosely tied by strings at their lower ends which go through a couple of holes in each when shaken a loud rattling sound is produced and so you scare crows my lad we query well ball he replies i'm trying to a little scarin don't harm why don't i shoot some on em and hang em up to scare t'others you can't persuade old farmer giles to do nothing of the kind for i heard him say too as how when he were young he knocked em over always and what did it do why his crops were simply spiled with the wire worms and other critters the rooks are fond on do you see them white birds hinder them sea males or gulls they're the masterpiece birds for picking up worms i ha seen em so full of em as they couldn't scarce fly do i know a rook from a crow i should jest think i do they ain't the same at all rooks prog together in flocks crows don't crows ha got brussels or bristles round the top bake or up a mandible and rooks ha got white skin on instead crows like dade things better than grubs and corn and taters do i like the job well i don't mind it there ain't a sight of hard work about it thank ye sir but i must be a gone yinder rooks are settlin athwout the field and master'll wonder if i'm clean gone to sleep or if i'm shanny our merry crow boy slouches away repeating his clapping and his merry refrain he appears an intelligent lad for such brainless labour and withal seems contented with his lot he is not the lout his fathers were for the days of compulsory education had dawned not in their time the yokel reads and thinks to-day and is not the serf in body and mind to the squire and parson as he was a generation or two ago whilst the squire and parson are more tolerant and broader-minded than many of their predecessors were it is well that larnan does not drive all the lads from the plough-tail and make them discontented with the dull monotony of an agricultural life our crow-boy may be tempted in the autumn like many of his class in this district when harvest is over to join a fishing crew and pursue the north sea herring fishery and will he be acting contrary to the instincts inherited from his forefathers the old vikings who were fishermen and farmers as well as warriors it is a glorious march morning the blustering winds that ushered in the month have dried up much of the moisture february left behind it the sun has forced a passage out between the clouds that obscured his face earlier in the day and his rays are lighting up the lane ahead of us with the weight of paraphernalia we are carrying 
for we are laden with the trappings of the angler we can easily believe old sol is gaining strength indeed the perspiration is standing in little beads upon our foreheads there are no conveyances here from the station to the broad until the warmer days shall lure larger numbers hither it is ten minutes since we rested by the scarecrow's gate let us sit a moment or two on this grassy bank a startled thrush dashes out of the hedge hard by us see it has already built its rough clay-lined nest there are a couple of eggs within it a pair of chaffinches on the tree behind us are choosing a site for the erection of theirs hey -o, here's a little violet peeping out from the bank side and another how beautiful they smell it was the scent and bright blue that betrayed them daisies dot the sward with their pearly faces and in the hole or ditch beneath the blackthorn are some pale yellow primroses which contrast strongly against the dark green leaves that sheltered them while they were yet unfolded those golden flowers nearer the water are the starry petals of the pilewort the humble bee has ventured out the catkins on the sallow upon our right have attracted several of these droning insects the leaves of the honeysuckle in the hedge appear ready to unfold in the field beyond the young grass has carpeted the soil with brightness there goes a rabbit and another how the merry things frisk and gamble a small flock of wood pigeons loudly smiting their pinions pass overhead in hurrying flight but for our presence which they observe not until close upon us they would most likely have dropped down in the wheat field behind us for a dinner of the young sweet blades what wild shy birds they are and notwithstanding the constant persecution to which they are subject they seem yearly on the increase here quietude and motionlessness are two great essentials to observation and if the naturalist would insinuate himself into the good graces of nature he must bring both qualifications into exercise note that hair hither it comes limping along the road ah your movement caught his quick eye and with a hasty bound he has darted through the hedge how strange it is and when unsuspicious of danger the hare sometimes keeps straight on and almost runs himself into it the position of his eyes may account for his not seeing so well ahead as on either side of him did you observe that small brown head peering above the bank there it is again it is a stoat he has scented the unlucky rodent and has already got upon his track so pertinaciously does the stoat keep upon the trail of an intended victim that we may be almost certain poor puss will fall an easy prey to him a frog just now plumped into the ditch this must surely be his first day's outing all winter through he lay snugly asleep in the mud below the little birds grow bolder and so long as we remain quiet they pop in and out among the thorny twigs and budding tree sprays but friend piscator it is time we were moving it's getting well towards the noon hour the waters of the broad will lie before us when we get beyond the village pub going inside well we might do worse if we might do better but a jug of hot steaming coffee and some sweet white bread and a bit of cheese will the better befit us for a foray among the perch the genial host is profuse in information and obliging as is the want of his fraternity 
to the drier portion of his clients sitting in a recess near a blazing log here is dispensed much genuine norfolk jargon and one may overhear the state of village things in general from their agricultural doings down to the very latest particulars about the squire's spaniel's recent litter of puppies piscator somewhat clumsily tumbles himself and his machinery into the boat for he is a heavy as well as an ancient member of the fraternity in a few minutes we are pulling over the rippling surface of the broad by the margin of which we swiftly glide along the coots are making love in the yellow reeds their harsh clicking like the sounds of the driving of stakes being hushed as our right oar crackles among the brittle stems there must be scores of them the moor hens are also on evidence quite a little colony of them flutter hastily into cover trailing their long lobated feet upon the water churning it into little bubbles in their progress as we turn a bend in the interminable array of straight sour reed stems here's a good hard bottom quoth a piscator and it's nicely under the lee very good we gently drop our huge flintstone anchors in about ten feet of water and throwing over a little ground bait affix our rods and tackle piscator is loud yet not too loud for suppressed exuberance is essential to success as much as baits in praise of some flat-tailed lobworms which he has had under training in soft damp moss this fortnight we wait not long for a nibble our float suddenly disappears in an oblique direction a goodly sized perch has evidently gone away with it we strike and manage to hook our client which strains hard at the line now rushing this way and now the other landing net quickly but piscator's attention is simultaneously called to his own float which has also vanished hey what a beauty he ejaculates as shaking itself furiously his fish rises to the surface cutting the water with its stiff spine dorsal fin and showing its fins of tyrian dye our friend's face is a study as the workings of his mind are depicted upon it it is a knowing perch that manages to outwit him bah the hook has given way and with a swirl of its great tail the fortunate fellow sinks down below to tell no doubt a tale of treachery a three-pounder if a fish at all cries piscator with a relaxed look of disappointment upon his countenance the tension on his line and nerves has slackened simultaneously surely that wounded fellow has made his companions doubtful of our intentions certain it is that biting ceases for a while and by way of variation we take to nibbling on our own account there's nothing like a solace of bread and cheese when a fluke has happened sitting quietly the various birds around us become assured and take but little notice of us the grebes have returned from the estuary they are coyly coquetting not far away what beautiful crests of black and red adorn their noble-looking heads soon they will be piling up those rotting leaves into a platform for their rough dull-shelled eggs who has not peered into a great grebe's egg basket without being struck by the swampy state of it the very eggs barely escaping the water that filters in but they take some finding for the birds are adepts at hiding and such mimics of surroundings are they those little birds that dashed out from the reed bed are willow wrens surely 
and that loud harsh cry from the tree clump was the note of the wryneck the latter is an unusually early arrival the mallard has already paired off yonder fly a couple the plain duck is being playfully pursued by her handsomer lover some petty difference or maybe the prying of a busy otter put them to flight what a splash they make as they strike the open water and settle there for an amorous gossip the white bald forehead of a coot is seen as it peeps out between the reeds now another more boldly ventures out they are not pleased with our close proximity what a noise yonder rooks are making in the treetops what squabblings over bits of sticks and twigs are indulged in unjust appropriativeness is a vice that is not exclusively human a flock of brent geese pass overhead northern bound some bearded tits are surveying the reed clump yonder as much in search of nesting quarters as of seeds or insects the mellow call of a redshank from an adjoining rond is distinctly heard and a pair of lapwings are noisily flying over yonder field you've a bite all right piscator and you've a nibble in giving his rod the wrist a huge sandwich is jerked into the water but what matters that when business is becoming brisk the moorhens will profit by the accident this time we land a fish apiece both sizable specimens as the saying goes two or three others are landed in course of time away goes our float again there's a big fellow at it this time surely we strike him and then begins a game at give and take what a whopper he must be it takes some manoeuvring to bring him to the surface when lo to our surprise we find we are fast to a fair-sized jack the lobworm smote his fancy and we finally lay him panting in the boat the strengthening of the wind brings our finishing cast earlier than it would have been but there is every appearance of an increase in it the air is growing keener on our way back to the stave we nearly clash oars with our old friend the fenman who has been getting in the last few rods of reeds we are sorry to decline his invite to drop in and have a cup of tea for the day is waning apace it is stiff work pulling against the wind and the dark waters are furrowed with foamy billows we miss the starlings from the reeds to-day they have already begun to think of housekeeping in the busier town observe yonder big hawk-like bird what grand sweeps it makes across the reed beds it is a marsh harrier circus eruginosus we are fortunate at seeing such a noble bird it is beating the reeds in search of a supper see a poor little moorhen unluckily taking to flight instead of diving is speedily pounced upon it has struck its needle-pointed talons into the waterfowl and has now settled upon a tussocky promontory that runs out from between the reeds the gamekeeper will be eager to level gun at the outlawed bird when occasion offers for unfortunately it does not always confine its attentions to such worthless game as this at least he says so we have not yet caught sight of the swallows for none have at present arrived the field fares and red wings are missing they have gone back to their northern homes we have not heard the cuckoo for though in march he search in april he shows his bill what ducks are those in the distance some hundred at the least 
lend us your field glasses piscator they are widgeon they are en route for the morasses of colder latitudes but have dropped in for a rest and feed it is tantalizing to the gunner whose right to maim and kill ran out on the last of february and the widgeon is no despicable morsel upon the table we wonder if our old friend the fenman has any scruples upon the matter why here comes the old fellow himself rowing as hard as his toughened arms will allow him we await his coming all right governor but i just thought as how you might like a tit-bit for your dinner to morrow he ventures to say giving a knowing look at us and another at piscator them old perch don't come up to a good cock's me or widgeon with a onion tucked inside him you can put em under the scaly ones if you fail at all nervous but law sir how kin a feller keep his finger off the trigger when sich a pretty little dinner piece gets in front of his fowlin piece we send the old gent back to the missus in very good spirits and quietly place the birds where he suggested who would condemn us the thing comes about so irresistibly and the most exemplary of us are amateur poachers at the worst and at the best the hunting instinct still lingers in us the last of the rooks has gone home to his roost the sparrows have got over their squabbling for perches and prestige in the ivy the larks have settled in the wheat field and the partridge is calling his mate in the brushwood as we enter the broadland station well satisfied with our exploits and glad to escape the rain that has begun to pelt down in a drenching shower as we rattle along piscator waxes chatty and even eloquent over the praises of broadland and the habits and characteristics of its finny inhabitants are expatiated upon at length what sport he queries can be so harmless or delightful so gently exciting without tendency to revelry and riot requiring so little exertion of body or incurring such minimum of risk what a trifling expense does it run to and what can be more conducive to health and one's general well-being one gets free from the foul atmosphere of the shop and office away from the worry and cares of business and mind you this a man up to his armpits in business and the worries of everyday life must have relaxation and recreation or a breakdown will come sooner or later a man may here turn his back upon toiling and moiling and enjoy nature in her quiet beauty and retirement to the full his surroundings and gentle pursuit banish dull care away for the time being and he returns home to his duties invigorated and none the worse able to meet life's disappointments and reverses as well as better able to appreciate its blessings i say hooray for the life of an angler and success to the general craft our friend's eloquence so far carries him away that oblivious of what his creel contains his hand comes down upon it with a bang when lo in a confused heap tumbled tins tackle fish and wildfowl and upon the top of them fall rods and himself as well as he makes a rush to prevent this consummation he has barely placed things in equilibrium when the face of the ticket collector appears at the carriage window and a stentorian voice utters the orthodox and stereotyped tickets gents please end of chapter three chapter four of man and nature on the broads 
by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain april in broadland beneath a willow long forsook the fisher seeks his custom nook and bursting through the crackling sedge he startles from the bordering wood the bashful wild duck's early brood by Walton. the days of mingled shower and sunshine have dawned upon peaceful broadland lured by the warmer days of an april sun and the refreshing raindrops nature has assumed a pleasant smile the pale young leaves are everywhere eagerly unfolding their beauties and the joyous birds are making the countryside merry with glad song above them all towering heavenwards the skylark pours out the fullness of its little heart in praise to its creator all thy works praise thee the clank of the bit is still heard in the fields for farmer giles and his good man hodge have not yet completed their sowing of the seed for the winter crops and it is pleasant to hear the cheery whoa of the ploughman as he rests for a moment the panting horses while he runs his eye with justifiable pride up the straight clean-cut furrow he has just turned over we can excuse his self-congratulatory remark the prince of wales couldn't cut a furrow cleaner if he tried bore we have reached broadland to-day by road for what can be more delightful than a country drive when the hedgerows are putting on their bright new vesture and the wild flowers are peering out from their mossy nooks beneath them and the little birds are playing at hide-and-seek in the thickening foliage preparatory to settling down to the sterner duties of domestic life it has been a glorious jog-trot and boxer has had matters pretty well all his own way to-day and mayhap has been wondering if we'd forgotten to bring the whip for its little hurrying he has had these six or seven miles who could scramble across country notwithstanding a smart passing shower necessitated the outbringing of the big green gingham strapped behind the footboard when so much that is lovely invited our attention and our admiration and the praise of him who pronounced as good the creatures of his hands there was scant room for an agnostic in our vehicle the blue of the harebell the ruddier tints of the wood sorrel and the pale yellow of the primrose contrasted delightfully with the fresh green blades of the various grasses which are shooting up their myriad spears how refreshing to the eye were the meadows dotted with buttercups and daisies and even more barren patches on the uplands sprinkled with the broad-leaved coltsfoot from among which peered the starry flowers of yellow and then the birds have they not been conspicuous by their presence and their song the wayside hedges and the woodland are peopling rapidly with the immigrant songsters the harsher cries of those that roam this district in the barren winter are replaced now by the cheerier melodies from a myriad little southerners throats but we are anticipating the wheels grind heavily at times when rumbling up and down hill for the recent rains have made the roads so soft and in places somewhat sloppy observe those pied wagtails at yon roadside puddle how oddly they flick their elongated tails as they daintily run beside it it may be there are some tiny midges gyrating over the pools which have smitten their fancy they take to erratic wing on our approach rooks have seriously settled to household duties 
such coring from daybreak until dusk returns is the order of the day surely the old elms never could have had noisier tenants that small bright brown birdie upon that hawthorn spray is a red start firetail the natives call him its plaintive wheat wheat becomes a familiar sound in the woodland in the month of april our steed pulls up at a horse pond to take a sip we spring out of the vehicle impelled by curiosity to take a peep in amongst some fern fronds uncurling to the warmth of springtime a tiny bird has just flown out and upon a bramble is fussily uttering its quick repeated notes it is a chiff-chaff see in the stubbly remnants of last year's grasses snugly sheltered by the fern leaves is its nest six small creamy white eggs are the treasures which have become a care to the half frightened over solicitous parent never fear bonny birdie we touch not such precious objects the chiff-chaff suddenly darts down in the thorny hedgerow a shadow as of a larger bird glides across the horse-pond we look up and discover the greater occasion of alarm in the shape of a hovering kestrel the speckled bird of prey might have had one eye upon the little percher with intent malicious but it certainly has had another upon a venturesome field mouse in the mead beyond down like a stone it descends upon the hapless rodent and as it hies away to some familiar rail stump whereon to devour it at its leisure we can discern the wretched creature struggling in the bird's sharp talons in turn the kestrel takes to precipitate flight its quick eye has detected the approaching gamekeeper who silly man has sworn some time or other to take away its life can he yet be so ignorant as to imagine this hawk is anything else but one of the greatest friends of the farmer and the rearer of our game birds several house martins conspicuous by the white upon their backs on rapid wing dash up and down above the horse pond and disappear over the firs that border it and again as suddenly return we are afloat once again upon the limpid waters of the broad boxer is munching his well-earned fodder in the reed thatch stable behind the village inn the knowing old animal enjoys a broadland visit to the full signs of life are showing everywhere around us last year's sapless leaf denuded reed stems are growing thinner and the remnants of those broken and the debris of the sedges and the rushes lie in a confused tangle more inextricably then if woven among them upon the surface of the water left unfortunately to decay and rot and then to sink beneath year by year this accumulation makes fresh soil and so as time rolls on the broads become more circumscribed in area thus it is that some of the smaller broads are now scarcely bigger than fish ponds gradually but surely if imperceptibly the swampy margins have extended then appropriation commences ditches are cut and pump mills are erected years long gone by the skeleton pump mill did nearly all the work then the tar-shaped article came into vogue powerful steam mills are now found cheaper to work and more effective and thus has it happened that the erstwhile resort of snipe and bittern is covered with waving grain and the partridge gleans amid the corn stubble above spots where the rudd and the bream not many years before were rooting and grubbing after larvae and mollusca amongst the subaqueous stems of reed and bulrush 
changes similar to these have reclaimed the fens from a chaos of waters to fertile acres where sleek fat kine deem life well worth the living and no sooner does the heavy rainfall swamp the lower corners and fill the ditches than the sails of the quaint old mills are placed before the wind and the excessive water is pumped or otherwise thrown by a huge water wheel into the sluices connected with the sluggish river by this means miles of marshes separated from the tidal river only by a bank or wall themselves below the level of flood tide are kept free from inundation as we slowly scull across the rippling waters of the broad we are roused from our rather pessimistic reverie by a noisy tumult as of quarrelsome birds a cuckoo skims across a reed bed to the terror or annoyance of some marsh tits that had been busy in among them they join a mixed mob of tits and finches that are already at its heels have they mistaken it for a hawk or is it a protestation against the cuckoo's fondness for usurping the rights of their little homesteads a pair of black-headed buntings pass just above head several grebes are disporting themselves in the water ahead of us what a merry life is theirs when unmolested their plumage is now at its best observe them through these glasses what curious crested heads of white and brown and black and what slender snake-like necks one or two evidently are fishing let us lay two beside this tiny promontory on our right and watch them there is a stake left by some angler who no doubt had a mind to erect a landmark to some propitious perch hole tie the painter to it and now whilst discussing luncheon we shall have a better chance of observing the birds around us for nothing conduces more to their hiding than the dodging to and fro of suspicious overlookers what appetites the broadland air gives birth to there it's just as we predicted the grebes emboldened by our silence have been paddling well this way how rapidly they swim there's at least half a dozen of them now they dive one has suddenly appeared above water with a juvenile roach between its mandibles a couple fly past us in grotesque flight with necks extended and with hanging feet this characteristic bird of broadland was at one time in danger of extermination when the craze for grebe skin muffs and trimmings was stronger than the dictates of humanity and reason reed warblers peer out from the yellow reed stems they will shortly be nesting but we will forbear to trespass on their privacy weaving their cup of a nest when the young green shoots are but a few inches above the waters as we see them now and using some three or four as a kind of scaffolding little by little it is lifted as the reeds grow longer until by the time the greenish white brown blotched eggs have become replaced by the downy chicks that inhabited them it is suspended at least a yard in the air a little bay sweeps away on our left the clicking of the coots has somewhat subsided surely there must have been some scandal going on this morning amongst them see a dark object has just come out from the reeds into the open water another follows those white foreheads make the coot's identity unmistakable three or four red-billed moorhens are cautiously paddling in an opposite direction there now your clumsy stumbling on that oar has caught their quick ears and vision how the moorhens take to startled flight 
trailing their long feet upon the surface of the water until rows of bubbles follow their receding forms the coots dive under and we see no more of them they evidently come up in the reedy phalanx where the eye cannot penetrate behind the reed bed is a clump of alders willows point upwards their slender twigs behind them and where the taller trees blot out the landscape beyond are some silver beeches contrasting their slender grey trunks against the deep green of the fir trees which bear them company on the topmost bough of one of them a great blue heron has just alighted what a grotesque fellow does he appear as balancing himself with his huge wings he clutches the slender perch with his big strong toes and claws those beeches are as dead as can be some years ago the herons nested in the branches but the onslaughts of prejudiced keepers ousted them and they have elsewhere started their heronry that fellow yonder with his beautiful apron is in magnificent plumage he has simply come to take a passing survey and will make up his mind as he did last year that to build here his home will be useless with a harsh frank he takes to wing and winnows his way to some ditches where the frogs are making amorous gossip or perhaps to a beck where the little rudd or roach are enjoying the sunny warmth of the shallows failing these the wakened newts or silvery sticklebacks will suit him just as well we have tired of our survey and again ply the oars hearken to the merry carol of the lark those feebler but sweeter notes are the love ditty of the black cap splash a green-headed mallard followed by his plain brown wife startled by the crackling of the reeds as our oar crashed in amongst them flies up from a narrow weedless pool in the midst of the reed bed what a grand fellow he looks as he overtops the reeds without a doubt somewhere in the herbage beneath the distorted branches of those dwarf sallows a nestful of pale green eggs is snugly covered those straggling curled leaves are the advance guard of the water lilies we must drop in here again in the summer days when the full spread leaves are crowding the placid waters and the beautiful white flowers are resting upon the surface and when the blue and yellow iris will be reproducing their bright tints in their reflected shadows those pure white swans yonder are contemplating nesting yon anglers are busy among the scaly inhabitants of the broad we will not disturb them the swallows have been dashing here and there all day and the plainer sand martins have been seen in goodly numbers they seem to find enough to do among the awakening insects especially those which delight to dance in sportive groups around and above the shooting broad plants they tell us of sunnier days in store let us steer into the narrow sluice which runs apparently close to the broad margin landing on a low-lying boggy spot we throw our painter round the bowl of a willow and daintily pick our way along a sinuous path the swampy soil sinking beneath our tread we must keep on moving or we shall come to grief in the quaking bog place your feet upon the grassy tussocks the sedge birds notes are heard on every side one anxious pair fussily fly around us wishing us no doubt be gone titlarks twit twit overhead here we are upon terra firma at our feet stretches a well weeded ditch bright with the yellow king cups great sprawling toads are clambering over and among the watercress 
trailing their long gelatinous strings of ova and a pair of yellow wagtails in their resplendent golden of springtime are searching for the larvae of insects here is an old willow stump covered with small leaved ivy the sallows around us are adorned with woolly buds among which great humble-bees drone and gossip yonder lapwings have laid their brown speckled eggs in the furrow and those wood pigeons making their way across the meadow have already built their nests far away stretch fertile fields the wooded hills beyond them forming an abrupt horizon here and there some grey and ivy mantled church tower marks the site of a village the red tiled houses of which peer out from among the trees that guard it our horses hoofs are once more smiting the road which trends towards the smoky town a small brick bridge spans the tributary river that loses its identity in the narrow neck of a reed surrounded broad the very reeds which line its banks link their roots with those which will be shortly waving their lanceolate leaves over the waters of the lagoon a quaint norfolk wherry lies moored beside the little staith against the bridge she is laden with bricks which have been carted up from a neighbouring village a towy-headed wherryman topped with a red wool cap makes a clumsy bow and wishes us good day there is a refreshing smell of tea emanating from the cabin door and a curl of faint blue smoke is issuing from the red wooden chimney won't you have a cup of tea the good-humoured skipper queries for he is a quondam friend of ours we acquiesce and jumping down we deliver the reins into the hands of his mate who has been sent ashore on purpose was ever such a quaint and picturesque craft the shoots of holland are not more in keeping with lowland scenery i know you like my old wherry topsy you've told me so afore well she's as rakish a craft as ever heel to winnard and she'll sail as close to the wind as any mortal thing afloat i'm proud on her and cape her as spick and span as mop and paint brush'll make her a heap of them london chaps have took her picture some with them likeness fakers and more than one had daubed her on a canvas they say bor as how there ain't our sort of wherry found nowhere else in england she's a bard of the broadland waters surely well you see she's built for local waters and for local requirements my craft you know is my livin as well as my hobby she's fifty foot in length with a beam of twelve and scarcely draws three foot of water and will carry thirty tons except this cabin she's one long hold the length of her i don't suppose you'll find another craft with such a big sail for her size as a norfolk wherry yo was amused i know with the forwardness of the mast but you see it's nicely balanced by that ton and a quarter of lead on its heel that windlass runs it up and lets it down just as we may want to hiss the sail or lower the mast to get beneath a bridge that little flag atop is a famous tell-tale for it's the slightest puff as is wanted to show the way the wind goes when winds are fair we spin along like lightning and when they're contrarywise we have to tack in course and should they fail us altogether we simply have to stick down the quant and clap on the shoulder agin it walk the plank and shove her along twenty mile o that will make you cough but for us many o the villagers jind in the rivers would find freightage rather awkward but law sir 
werryin's nothin near what it were for the railways have cut it up most awful still as they don't run everywhere and as we can bait em on the score of cheapness we shan't die out us werrymen as yet their sights as not come up to a fleet of wherries a startin from yarmouth on the early flood some carryin general cargoes others corn and others timber it's a fine sight as seein them cuttin across to old braden so you like my little cabin well bor there's many a wuss box than this to sleep in leastways i sleep and my mate he snores fit to bust up the hatchways we're bachelors here my mate and me you know but his an old woman lives up in the town and mine's fixed up in the village seven mile from here we've got all the odds and ends for cookin and comfort as we want jim can make a puddin or a dumplin leastways he makes pretence at em and if you can call a ball of wax inside kivered with a inch of sloppiness he can make em and no mistake and what do could lie snugger and we do at night time on these ere benches with proper toggeries to make em soft and keep us warm and my tea ain't bad ball for the leaves were left in from monday and this is friday stop a minute let me take that bit of baggy off as is floatin in your cup i expect that's an old quid as dropped off the mantel shelf now i'll just put the pot aside on the hob for smiler that's my mate you know and now for a pipe of baccy afore you go bor a friendly gossip follows in which the birds and beasties and various items that delight a broadland naturalist are discussed with mutual relish but which space forbids to detail two hours later boxer is munching his hay in the stable at home and a savoury bloater fresh down from the loves is engrossing our own attentions End of chapter four chapter five of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain may in broadland humble race of men a like amphibious by kind nature's hand formed to exist on water and on land from life of a fenman seventeen seventy one the river yare runs its enormous torrent of dull brown waters on a sluggish ebb into the german ocean the streams which focus themselves at braden a huge backwater two thousand acres in extent are three the yare by some still named the wensum which trails its sinuous stream through norwich and marshland continuing its course to the sea the bure draining north-east norfolk and the waveney that divides the county from its neighbour suffolk these with some smaller tributaries drain some fourteen hundred square miles of country excepting only three or four all the great freshwater lagoons now so well known as the norfolk broads are connected with these rivers they cover nearly five thousand acres the rivers offering nearly two hundred miles of navigable waterways here's el dorado indeed for the yachtsman the naturalist and the tourist and to-day we will reach the broads by water smiling may has burst upon us amid the merry music of birds and clad in a vesture of many tinted greens the hedgerows are bright with the white-scented blossoms of the hawthorn the thorny stems of the dog-rose are adorned with the pale pink petals and festoons of the climbing honeysuckle 
fill the air with fragrance here the droning bees delight to work and the light-winged butterflies to dance and coquette cowslips dot the meadows but in many places are far outnumbered by the yellow crowfoot which children delight to call the buttercup on the hedge banks the azure blue flowers of the germander are conspicuous whilst hard by the milkwort is pushing up its pink blossoms and the humbler red nettle bears them company birds are singing their sweetest love songs in bush and tree and hedgerow and above them soars the plainest bird of all the blithesome lark but never a one can outdo him at a roundelay a bright and almost cloudless day of clear shining tinges all nature with sunshine our spirits are in harmony with our surroundings on such a day as this we would make our way to the broads it is early yet for yachting but more than one white-winged craft shows its great glistening sails above the lowlands that stretch away north and westwards from the town those dark brown sails which seem to rise out of the very marshes and glide this way and that denote the progress of the quaint norfolk wherries along the course of the serpentine bure some friends of ours are about to indulge in a day's outing upon the river and we have accepted their invitation to bear them company as far as they choose to ferry us thence we hope to boat our way across one of the largest of the broads and return by rail behold us bowling along under all canvas the bonny lapwing cleaving her way in gallant style through the rippling waters the steady breeze pressing her onward splendid boats are these norfolk yachts spreading plenty of canvas with tall tapering masts long gaffs and longer bowsprits with plenty of counter very little keel and enormous rudders they are easy to handle and in experienced hands are a thing of beauty and a joy for as long as the breeze holds good but the bends of the river as the stream winds its circuitous course keep the man at the tiller busy for now we have to get upon this tack and then upon the other how bewilderingly the river twisters we seem from time to time to be heading for every point of the compass now we're on our starboard then our port side now beating up to winnard then off we go again spinning along so gaily our great sails bellying to the wind then we tack again the canvas fluttering like the wing of some seabird shaking off the spray until we catch the breeze again and off we go upon the other tack but how jolly and exhilarating what a sense of buoyancy and freedom we feel unfettered for a while from the conventionalities and the restraints of society and of business oh life is a river and man is the boat that over its service is destined to float while joys the cargo so easily stored that he is a fool who takes sorrow aboard we have left the many gabled town behind us the lower reaches of the river are flat and uninteresting the dull level beyond the river banks being relieved here and there only by some grim old pump mill some marshman's low-built homestead or a style of gnarly timbers against which sleek cattle rub their sides and chew the cud the marshes are alive with cattle now we pass a deeply laden wherry with the skipper quant at shoulder shoving her round to catch the breeze whilst the mate who mayhap is the good man's missus 
is leaning against the tiller on we glide past riverside villages with their windmills and ferries and clumps of trees the monotonously dull flat scenery which they tell us savours so much of that which is dutch from stokesby onward the aspect changes for the better and pretty little nooks and corners that many an artist has reproduced on canvas loom into view shooting through acle bridge with lowered mast we hoist sail again and still keep bowling along up the bure till we reach thurn mouth then on again up this tributary past a picturesque half barn half farmhouse upon which a clump of trees cast their shadows and then past womack dyke until we reach potterham where we moor here after a jolly luncheon at the famous hostelry which overlooks the river we bid adieu to our yachting friends who are bent on making again for the bure and sailing still further northwards gliding along over the clear shallow waters margined by the yet short young reeds of the year above which the leafless tottering stems of an older growth are drooping and fast going to decay we make for the open broad splashing noises in amongst them tell us that a shoal of bright finned rudd are not far away from us we are not provided with tackle or we should not be able to resist the temptation to throw them a baited hook we fling in a few breadcrumbs however and after them dash the bold handsome finners rudd love these quiet waters undisturbed as they are by rapid tides where the tall reeds nod above sheltered pools they are sociable fellows with their species mayhap they are seeking a spawning ground for they shed their over in the early springtime a splash hard by as of a huge dog flinging himself into the water is followed by a speedy dispersal of the shoal look didn't you see that long-jawed head of a pike rise above the surface holding between its shark-like teeth one of the luckless fishes with a swirl of his big forked tail he is far below and is off to his snug lair known only to himself to devour his victim at his leisure yonder noah's ark like structure moored beside the reeded rond is the hut of an eel catcher in the stern sheets just outside his cabin door sits the occupant munching his noontide meal he is a character in his little way and it will repay us to get winnered of him and edge him into a gossip he wishes us the sailor the day for your native gruff as he may be has a share of inbred politeness our boat glides between some curiously perforated boxes which float round his strange houseboat and crowds her stem into the wall of rushes at the river margin a savoury aroma emanates from the cabin an odour of fried eggs and bacon and bacon it is which lies spread upon the old man's platter a big bit of earthenware has been chipped off it but sufficient space remains to contain the huge slice of what was once part of an aged porker if guessing may be reckoned trustworthy and it is so fat that few besides an eelman's stomach could bear the infliction of digesting it he sits a while in silence with the plate upon his knees but keeps on champing with his remaining tooth stumps they are on special duty this morning after a little preamble a desultory conversation is kept up upon birds and fishes such as share the wild watery waste with him for he has been knowingly reckoning us up with those small grey eyes of his 
and we find him not only full of information but exceedingly communicative dinner meanwhile comes to an end and leaning over the stern of his vessel he rinses his plate and sundries in the clear waters which float him then tossing off a mug of something that presumably is tea although it looks uncommonly like liquid blacking from long standing in the teapot with half a spout upon it he steps back into the ark and invites us inside for a continuance of our conflab this ain't the sort of shanty you gents are used to but they suits us folks as they're built for up to the knocker i don't suppose you'd find their likes out of the county we look up an old smack's boat bodge her up a bit then rig her up with a ruff and surroundings and tars em, and there you are bore as nobby a craft as you'll find afloat these ere benches as we're sitting on sarve for bedsteads a sack of sweet mesh hay and a blanket or two to tuck yourself in and i'll swallow my eel pick if you'll want much rockin to find your sleep in this ere strong pure air of broadland you'll smile at my jim cracks in the shape of furniture well it ain't much as we want bor a mug and a basin or two a teapot a kettle and a frying pan with a knife and fork so we don't need to eat like injuns and what more do you want let me rub my sleeve on that bit o' looking glass for it's many a long day as i seed inside it and the smoke and the steam ha kind of dullened it we're rough and ready sort of folks you know and living out here a lonesome robinson cruiser kind of life wipes all the polish off us i don't have many wisitors and an old man ain't many fancies and if folk don't like it they ain't obliged to stop not as i means you gentlemen a short clay pipe is found in the deep recesses of one of his waistcoat pockets after much fumbling in its corners it is harder work so it appears to find that with which to load it there is a hungry look in the old man's eye which seems to ask for backer we hand him enough to fill his pipe not once but often the deep old fellow thaws yet more and after incidentally remarking that it's a two-mile row to get a smoke when baggy ha got to low water he resumes his patter what's them holy boxes outside for them's eel trunks you don't need in course to ax me what's my profession of course you don't for half an eye's enough to tell it boy and man like my father afore me eel catchin and a few other oddments has got me my livin these fifty year and more and it's a moderate livin at most but i get enough to eat and pay my way keepin the old woman's cupboard at home well filled and what more do a fellow want only to be thankful to our heavenly father as give him the strength and health to appreciate em babbin's mostly my business just now and will be till the summer's over and forgotten and the eels be makin for the sea then we drop eel sets in the river to catch em when they're runnin the eel sets are suffin like a big trawl net with the mouth athwart the river into it the scrigglers swim and down to the poke end they wriggle in course we take good care by means of proper contrivances to puzzle em how to get out again dark wet september nights are the best for this fishin especially if a bit of thunder keeps a rumblin in a good season tons of eels are taken and sent to the london markets them cockneys don't so they tell me on em what's babbin like ball well i'll tell you it's as easy as easy if you only knows how 
you'll get some wallums as you can any damp night when they turn up on the grass to mardle you'll want a lantern and a tin and you'll want to look lively for they soon pop in again when you'll want to bab you'll make a bab and this is how you'll do it i might as well show you for i shall be babbin to-night down hinder taking out a tin of lively worms and finding up some thread and a needle he begins impaling each unhappy victim making quite a festoon of them we try to watch the operation without a shudder he evidently thinks he has put in the worms to very little inconvenience yell them bunch em up like so winding them round his fingers and tie up in a knot fix on your sinker and there you are tie the lot on the end of your line bob it up and down till you feel an eel a chuckin then heave him up gently and drop him in your boat which he'll do when his teeth get disentangled we sometimes catch two or three stun a night sometimes never a eel bore them boxes outside we pop em into where they don't seem very uncomfortable for the tide goes through em cause they're riddled with holes then when we want to sell em there you are you see what about the winter well we go a pickin for sich eels as a buried theirselves in the mud bore for all don't travel seawards here's an eel pick eels is rum things lor they're as big a mystery as anything i knows on some say they grows from hoss hairs some say they've young ends i don't believe neither why i've seen under a magnifier what folks calls the fat of the eel and it's no more nor less than eggs the over as a gent called it don't grow very big till the eels are in the deep seas where they spawn goodness only knows where and where the old uns go after is just as big a wonder anyway i've seed little totty eels not bigger nor darnin needles and you can see through em comin up the shallows from the sea in thousands in the springtime much more eel lore is dispensed which space forbids to detail as we are leaving the old man in his lonesome hut to step into our boat a kingfisher dashes off the end of an oar which has been lying akimbo and with a startled scream is lost in a bend in the reed bed some tiny scales sparkle upon the blade which we examine more closely the kingfisher unnoticed by us and accustomed perhaps to the eel babber's voice had evidently been fishing from our oar blade here is certainly proof positive that he has had a little fish for dinner some coots that have waxed bold enough to venture out in the open disappear as if by magic and a couple of red-billed moorhens dash off with more precipitancy than caution trailing their feet in the water as they widen the distance between us yonder flies a heron let us row for the far side of the broad but for the sounds of bird life the quietude would become oppressive such strange music is borne on the wings of the wind harsh wild cries jarring notes and the sweeter sounds of bird song it is the season of love each little songster is vying with its fellows in making cheerful harmony even the rooks in the tall trees yonder seem to think their efforts praiseworthy but they are appropriate to the scenery around as are the harsh notes of the grebes and waterfowl the reed bunting and the sedge warbler and many another of their kindred from oversea are present with us 
some are flitting in among the branches of the trees which border the mossy swamps that margin the broad others are busy in among the remnant of reed stems seeking a location for safe nesting many are already engrossed with the cares of domestic life we pull round a bend in the interminable reed bed and find ourselves in a quiet corner of the broad it is a veritable little straits connecting this one with another willows are reflecting their pointed leaves in its depths reeds and sedges in its sunny recesses are growing more luxuriantly than in the open broad a rickety footbridge spans the farther end and on it is sitting a hawk-like bird which presently takes to flight its ringing notes betray its identity it is a cuckoo some lapwings pass overhead they are nesting in an adjacent meadow hush do you not see that big brown creature sitting beside a bank on a boulder of grass fringed soil that has broken away from it it is an otter gently just peep at him through these glasses he is busy at dinner that fish he appears enjoying so much is undoubtedly a tench the otter knows where good fish and quietude are to be had there now he has spied us and with the slightest effort and without a splash he has dived into the water and will not come up until he has reached his lair in some rush-covered corner house martins and swallows are dashing to and fro as they have been all day long here they appear to be especially busy for many a lace-winged fly is taking its earliest springtime airing and larvae cases floating upon the surface of the water are familiar objects to the lynx-eyed naturalist there is a shoal of small gudgeon they are feasting merrily upon heedless little insects which appear to delight in touching the water in their joyous play gnats and midges are among the number there goes high overhead a swift and another hearken to their wild screaming don't you see that moorhen peering out from behind that willow bowl he has a nest somewhere close by it let us paddle up and see if we can find it the cunning thing has vanished but here is its inartificial nest it is made of reed flags and sedges matter together nine buffish white eggs dotted with red-brown contain the fondest hopes of most attentive parents a faint peepy cry emanates from among them why one egg is chipping and a tiny pair of red mandibles are poking their way into a world of trouble if half of those black downy chicks which will soon be demanding incessant care and attention escape the onslaughts of pike and a host of other enemies they will do well we may not loiter to inspect the swamp where the white swans are nesting if we do we shall not be welcomed by them nor hunt for a great grebe's floating egg basket much that we see and do must remain unknown save by ourselves for our space forbids it we could linger yet but the time has sped and our watches are pointing well towards train time behold us at eventide in the middle of may sculling in a gun punt up braden making for one of the drains which at low water vein its muddy breast the tide is rising and the flats by the hundred acres are disappearing below the flood here and there the lumps still dry and uncovered are gradually growing less in area strange whistles and call notes are heard as many a long-legged wading bird is ousted from its feeding ground 
and compelled to seek a drier location for when too deep for walking it must needs swim or flit which latter it prefers to do the spring migration has set in and many a northward bound bird drops in upon us amongst them the wimbrel knot and dunlin the turnstone grey plover and pygmy curlew and many another these attracted by so fine a feeding ground drop in a while and refresh themselves and proceed upon their journey many a rarer bird attired in its springtime best mingles with the commoner herd but close time has thrown its protecting clauses around them and they remain unmolested by the gunner who envies them their jackets the bird stuffer now loses his richest plumage specimens there was no close season until well into the seventies let us draw to the highest of the lumps all else is covered with the water here the birds are making their last stand prior to betaking themselves to the marshes the seashore or still farther away what a medley of notes and what a concourse of birds are before us there runs a turnstone there are six of them at least those mellow call notes denote the presence of several ring plovers and their black gorgets also betray them grey plovers some curlews dunlins and others are also identified what sooty long-winged birds are they which now dropped in at the water's edge they are black terns and the species once nested in broadland and those pearly-backed swallow-like seabirds with them are arctic terns they are tame enough poor things what havoc a gunner might make in their serried ranks day after day till the month is out will such birds be seen if the winds blow fair from the east at any point with westerly winds continuously blowing fewer and fewer birds will put in an appearance he is a lucky man who chance time sees here the beautiful avocet the quainter spoonbill and the lordly stork the day is spent darkness covers all and nothing now denotes the presence of the birds but their weird wild notes End of chapter 5chapter six of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain june in broadland and the wavy swell of the sowing reeds and the wave-worn horns of the echoing bank and the silvery marsh flowers that throng the desolate creeks and pools among were flooded over with eddying song gayest of the months of the year smiling june dawns upon us garlanded with roses the fields and woods and hedges are glowing with the warm touch of her fingers and all nature seems joyous and light-hearted there is the slightest ripple upon the surface of old ocean and a faint murmur falls on the ear as the tiny wavelets crowd each other as if in play upon the shingly shore in broadland there is quietude save as the birds make merry music and the lowing kine join in with deeper bass and the bleating of sheep is heard or save when the playful wind whispers in the treetops that here and there fling their shadows upon the placid waters below and it bustles up and down the crowded ranks of pale green reeds until from among their leafy stems waving and rustling arises a murmur that reminds us of the gentle plashing of the wavelets upon the sea beach on such a morning 
we find ourselves at the railway station securing tickets for a jolly day's outing in broadland ere long we are being borne through furzy and bracken covered sand hills beyond the valleys of which are caught glimpses of the deep blue sea now across fields where the dark green corn is growing sometimes shut in for a brief space by trees and tall hedgerows but more often rumbling along in the open with miles and miles of landscape stretching away on either side of us with the distance softened off into foliage from among which here and there peers out a grey church tower like an aged sentinel keeping watch upon the quiet village which clusters round the hallowed pile we have fallen in with genial company to-day a genuine broadland naturalist has chosen the same compartment he is bent on a day's hard work among the insects and wild flowers if such a labour of love deserves the title and for the capture and accommodation of which he appears amply provided which buzz and bloom in the fens and wildernesses of broadland he is certainly a character in his way a small spare-built man past the middle of life with shoulders bent and betokening that some sedentary occupation has for long been his lot in life and years of hard honest toil have made his large hands gaunt and bony we are not long edging him into a pleasant confab and the hard lines upon his intelligent face relax somewhat as he instinctively feels himself in company with kindred spirits he waxes eloquent upon the delights of broadland you may have your rugged or inspiring mountain scenery your wild rocky fastnesses if you choose not that i have ever been amongst them except in books of travel but i can pretty well reckon what they'd be like but give me my low-lying marsh-covered reedy broadland where the redshank the coot the grebe and the lapwing ring out their strange weird cries the land of the bulrush and the water-lily has delights for me that i am positive no other could possess these fifty years have i spent boy and man amongst snips of leather Lass and lapstone were my toys in childhood and they get me my living now thump 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 snobbing is dull monotonous labour to be sure from morning to night with the smell of leather beneath your olfactories but a man must live by the sweat of his brow but then sir when one does manage to get his leg loose from the boot strap and let it and the other stride and scamper out in the open country on such a day as this why how much lighter becomes the burden of life and what a pleasant little oasis in its dreary routine to be sure it is not that i am unhappy or discontented by any means for the fruits of many a jaunt in broadland surround me when at my labour in the shape of well-preserved specimens which stir up many a pleasant recollection of sunny days and jolly doings among the flowers and insects the birds and mollusks in times gone by to accomplish much real work as a naturalist a man needs to be above the necessity of earning his daily bread and the time should be his own but then sir there's this about it when one's destined to earn his livelihood by close hard grinding labour because fortune failed to smile upon his predecessors he cannot afford to quarrel with her labour well one has got used to it by this time without the comfort or inconvenience of having grown any the richer 
for competency is not won you know by snobbing but there's this to be said of it it's more a matter of hand than head work you can sit and thump and think and thump and plan and meditate between them to your heart's content which can't be said of every occupation it comes hard where a man hasn't a hobby or any mental employment and nothing to anticipate in event of a holiday then the humdrum becomes a bore that's why so many of my fraternity grumble about life's monotony over their pipe and pot and engender discontent against their fellow men and the good god above us all who never destined man i am quite convinced to be unhappy whatever sphere of life he placed him in sir there is dignity in labour such is a sample of the interesting chat our loquacious friend unreels and we regret our paths diverge as we step out from the village platform whistling a merry song away high is the little man with the nets and wallet which contains his store boxes and bottles and the hundred other little knick-knacks that go to form a naturalist's outfit it is well for him that his captures will be light even if numerous for the paraphernalia he carries is sufficient weight of itself the lanes are now in the zenith of their beauty the humble bee and his kindred and a host of meadow-brown tortoiseshell and other butterflies dance and gossip and glean among the bright flowers which dot the hedge-banks and push out their gay petals from between the stouter growth that would obscure them in their quest of sunshine there is a wealth of coloration on every hand the yellow hawkweeds have opened their starry flowers and are smiling in the scraggiest of places where sweet air stirs the bluebells lightly and where prickly furze buds lavish gold a hundred others lend their charms to make the countryside beautiful above them all tower the sweet-scented honeysuckle and the pale pink flowers of the dog rose the meadows beyond are made gay with sorrel and many other familiar wild plant while lazy bovines wading amid luxuriant grasses are enjoying their brief existence eyeing yonder farmer and the butcher's man in blue without the slightest suspicion that their happy days are numbered the ditches are brimful of life from sluggish tadpoles and flashing sticklebacks down to the tiny volvox and the unseen rotifera and other animal culae our naturalist has by this time doubtless filled some of his bottles with specimens for we noted him groping and dredging at a ditch side soon after we parted company this very dyke trends away broadwards and possesses in miniature many of the features which characterize those great lagoons here are some yellow water lilies nufa lutea their small golden cups contrasting prettily with the dark ovate leaves from which they lift their heads forget-me-nots are sprinkled along the edge of the crowding reeds and taller irises with spangles of yellow and blue look down upon them whilst above all nod and rustle the green spear leaves of the reeds and around them tiny insects sport and play to the profit of many a swallow and sand martin that are dashing to and fro a kingfisher hurries away from a willow bowl at our approach the ruddy hues of his breast reflecting in the water below him his emerald wing and tail coverts appearing like streaks of burnished metal as he flies in a bee line to some shady nook he knows of some tiny black animals too quickly for the eye to follow them 
plunge into the still waters like so many stones they are water shrews and are of all our british mammalia the most secretive in their ways and habits we have not time to loiter longer or we would certainly try and steal a march upon them we have noticed many a young bird of the year as we came along for the first birds have been started off to earn a livelihood on their own account little tits and larger finches not nearly so brightly plumaged as they hope to be next springtime dot the hedgerows forage in the herbage below them or fly on hasty wing hither and thither insects are swarming and well it is that they are so or the insectivorous birds would go to roost hungry and the seed-eaters are now revelling in plenty it is pleasant to glide softly on the rippling waters scarce dipping the oars beneath the surface the hum of life and the rustle of vegetation are soothing to the jaded toiler a day's outing like this is rest and balm to both body and mind let the boat drift whither she will we are not tied to any special doing to-day not that we would kill time but it is delightful to feel ourselves once more away from the worry and the bustle and the conventionalities of town life and for the nonce to leave ledgers and hammers and scales and yardsticks away in that chaos of brick and mortar where even the sparrows are sooty and the flowers and trees are dusty and what little of nature is forced to breathe and grow in such uncongenial atmosphere seems pining for the purer air and sunlight of the country there certainly is not much that is awe-inspiring in these great solitudes and there is a strange sameness about them all but they are lovely with a beauty peculiarly their own grand indeed are these great indented ovals of silvery water apparently shut out from the rest of the busy workaday world by an interminable belt of reed and sedge and bulrush and an environment of stunted woodland where you might almost imagine dull care and the strife of life would scarce find a loophole for an entrance yonder is our friend the fenman's cottage standing upon the higher ground with its foreshore sloping to the water's edge in autumn the trees on one side shake their leaves into it great white ducks are guarding their young broods in the sluice which trends towards the house and several geese are cropping the grass near by them the old punt is away to-day towards eventide we may expect the return of the master for this morning jem trets at hazel he is yet hale and hearty and the old lady has something in the cupboard to which he will do ample justice on his return in the evening with his boat piled up with gladden and other coarse herbage to be used as litter in the pigsty and bed for the ancient donkey whose scraggy appearance would suggest him to be as aged as his patron yonder is an artist at work with brush and maul stick let us run the boat ashore and saunter towards him a moorhen flutters out of the little reed bed as our oar sweeps through it beneath a shoal of small roach dash away in a fright all making for the open broad our friend of the easel is throwing on his canvas a delightful bit of scenery in the foreground big broad-leaved sedges dip their reflex in a pool of crystal above them is a willow's drooping foliage tall graceful reeds on the right lose themselves in the background in a cul-de-sac of alders whilst a plank bridge with a rustic fencing is thrown across the pool a trio of black-headed gulls show up boldly against a bit of blue sky was ever such a lovely little corner piece 
our artist friend is loud in the praises of broadland an aged man bent with many years wending his way from the fenman's cottage sidles up to us and expresses his opinion upon the picture as well as upon the state of things in general well bore you ha done that a suffin proper what nimble fingers some foot have to be sure i might a tried these seventy year and more to ha done that and couldn't says jem trett's elder brother for the merest trio of a physiognomist could have told his relationship to the old man of the fens ah bore these ere broads he continues aren't what they were fifty year ago not at all they ain't like the sam not as the water is different or the bards and other critters ha altered although there's summat wrong with em there ain't so many on em as there was by a wery long chalk talk of carrying a gun nowadays why it ain't no use at all but a waste of good powder and time time was when i were a youngster we could do a bit of shootin in this wery neighbourhood i ha put up five bottle bumps or bitterns in a day and shot three on em and thought nothing on it now if one is heared on every man jack as shoulders a shootin iron is on the rampage arter it why cause they're scarce and gents ha got a craze for em for stuffin em like as they have them pretty black and white avocets i've heard my father say as how them long-legged critters built their nests and by them trees out hinder and a lot of old herons built in the tree tops which seems a funny thing for a water bird to do why are the bitterns and them no longer plentiful why ain't they drained the mashes or marshes and the lowlands turning thousands of acres into pastures and cultivation i've heard my old dad say and true it were too for we shall rue it if t be true that fens be undertaken and where we feed in fen and reed they'll feed both beef and bacon and don't they besides there ain't the lay or shelter for the birds there was would you come here mr painter if you couldn't get a place worth a daubin on that ere picture well that's the way with em as to them clinkers or avocets i've heard the old man say them chaps as fish for salmon up in newcastle was the cause of they a leavin indeed they were wiped out clean for the sake of their feathers as was made up into artificial flies we see one now and again so we do a bitten but they are foreigners as only come over in april and may if they don't stop they get killed and then they're obliged to surely lord gentlemen times is altered altogether see them geese hinder years ago we used to rear thousands afore iron and brass pens was made we bred em for their quills and feathers and gozzards or goose herds were as much thought on and wanted as shepherds is to-day we plucked em alive four or five times a year fussed at lady day for body and wing feathers t'other times for body feathers only the young ends we broke in even at six weeks old by plucking out their tails cruel well bore i suppose you'd reckon it were and perhaps it was but you see things were different then you can't whack a stubborn old dicky now so i've heard say a throat a man in brass buttons having your afore the beaks pretty how to do and then there's everything else as has gone wrong we used to burn dried cow dung and hovers or peat now we have coals 
in course them puffin billies or trains had turned all that over not as that matters much there's a change too they ha made we used to be quiet here once more but now see what swarms of folks a holiday mag and they turn in upon us yachtin i can do with providin them chaps in blazers on em don't overdo it but i hate them steamers as upsets every mortal thing tearin through the water like nobody knows what frightenin birds and scarin fish and playin the wherry trundle up with everything there ain't the fish in the rivers there were for how kin the spawn dashed and knocked about by the swell among the reeds ever come to life then them landowners as have been pullin the string closin up the broads for shootin and fishin and tellin ye yow mustn't go here nor there why it's sheer robbin of us it is of our rights i've heerd say the law locks up the man or woman as steals a goose from off a common but lets the bigger robber loose as nicks the common from the goose and i don't know as that ain't the way things are going on everywhere else ah gentlemen things are going wrong altogether wrong much more does the ancient fellow unreal of his yarn of things that have long since vanished regretting the passing away of old times as a calamity to be bewailed but we humour him for an old man has his weaknesses he loves to talk and grumble and ruminate and why shouldn't he he too like the old order of things will soon have stepped into the obscurity of the past with his quaint attire and quainter ways and his store of ancient history we are once again afloat leaving the artist to listen to the rest of the old man's rhapsody coots moorhens swans grebes and various hedge birds are seen and watched in turn in a corner of the broad we come across a brace of young urchins busily catching small roach and tiny gudgeon and right merrily the truants for no doubt the schoolmaster will know them well as such are hauling out the hungry finners with an osier twig and a bit of string upon which a bung is made to serve the purpose of a float with their towy heads plump naked legs and ruddy cheeks the youngsters look the very picture of health and carelessness they will trot home betimes to receive a drubbing no doubt and a hunk of bread for supper and make perhaps as little fuss over the one as they will ravenously enjoy the other may care sit as lightly on their shoulders in the days to come as it does to-day hosts of black-headed gulls are making merry on the broad some are washing their spotless plumage in its cool waters others are apparently at rest while many are taking exercise on airy pinions for they have no doubt been spending long tiring hopeful hours upon their large brown speckled eggs not far away from here on a swampy island hundreds of nests may be found containing eggs in every stage of incubation and many of them already are tenanted by the yellow downy puffballs of chicks these birds at breeding time are strictly preserved many hundreds of the earlier eggs are taken by the keeper and realize a goodly sum they are not bad eating the eggs are laid in a cavity formed by trampling down the broken tops of the reeds and sedges and generally number three it is a sorry time for grubs and worms for miles around when the gulls come home to their breeding grounds they scour the countryside for many a mile and farmer giles looks upon them with a kindly eye thick clouds have been piling up in the west and big raindrops dancing on the surface of the water warn us to seek shelter from the coming storm 
we pull away hard for the stave and reach it not a little moist for the shower is pelting down in a seeming hurry right gladly we rub shoulders with our naturalist friend of the morning as we enter the village station and it is a right good time he treats us to over the luck he has had in his day's perambulation need we say we offer no negative to a pressing invite to turn over with him at nightfall the treasures he has been collecting end of chapter six Chapter 7 of Man and Nature on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. July in Broadland. Glide gently, thus forever glide, O Bure, that anglers all may see as lovely visions by thy side, as now, fair river, come to me amid a blaze of colouring and beaming with sunshine july makes its advent in the land of the broads a thousand forms of insect life hum and drone its praises as they dance and flirt in the sunlight a legion of wild flowers open their petals and welcome its warm kisses in town and city the heat has become oppressive and hosts of holiday-makers crowd down to the seashore and the country in quest of rest and health we too would banish awhile the worries and cares of town life and take a longed-for respite from them broadland with its quiet waterways and quieter lagoons is to us far preferable to the more animated resorts where even in their hard-earned leisure each yet jostles against the shoulders of his fellow give us the silent flowing river and the silvery lake where the ripple laps soothing music around the white-winged vessel and the tall reeds rustle and sow as the playful winds sway them to and fro our friend the artist is still at work on the broads with brush and palette indeed so busy is he that he has banished himself a while from society and in his quaint noah's ark of a houseboat is living afloat taking his house as the snail takes his wherever he may feel disposed for the time to settle gladly have we agreed to spend a day or two with him our old acquaintance the wherryman most fortunately is about to loose the topsy from her picturesque moorings near the old north tower taking advantage of the early flood he has recently brought down a cargo of oak billet timbers in three or four lengths of the more slender bells which are useless for soaring into boards these lie piled upon the quay in a distorted stack a couple of guernsey coated fellows are busily loading a barrow cart from it their destination being a fish curing house that billet in the autumn will give out volumes of dense smoke beneath thousands of north sea herrings turning with its pungent qualities silvery fishes into delightful titbits for the breakfast table and into bags of gold for those who cure them in its place the topsy has now a generally assorted cargo merrily clinks the winch as the enormous brown sail slowly expands itself and the gaff is run well up the great mast let her go shouts the skipper to his mate who lets her go loosing her by a dexterous jerk of the rope which lifts its eye clear of the mooring stump this is pulled aboard and stowed away as soon as we clear the surrounding buildings we catch the breeze and away like a thing of life the topsy glides cutting the water as a ploughshare slides through the crumbling earth 
it is blowing a fair wind to-day and right quickly we pass the objects on the river banks sleek kine stare wonderingly at us from beside gnarly timbered stiles here and there a marshman's cottage and its surrounding alders looms into view and then a drainage mill three and twenty mile bore and take us long to do to-day if the wind holds good says the skipper so tis stalham you're bound for well that were lucky as i happen to be gone there too what a rummin your painter friend is i never seed a feller rub on the colours same as he do so quick too why afore he ha run his brush over half a dozen times you seem to know the wery place as is comin here's a picture as he done t'other day and give me there's his houseboat with the chimney front on it is old tyke barber's yawl with his eel set aboard it again her bells is a gun punt in course that's me a sittin in the boat how natural them reeds a frontin us look don't they some are growin straight others are leanin and them broken ones look as real as they wore bore how i laughed one day as he wore a skitchin on a rond he'd just finished his picture and gone aboard for suffin leavin it on the sticks an old cow as were munchin close agin it walked up and took a boss at it she seed the grass and sich like and a likeness of a small brown calf what did she do bore but begin lickin it thinkin no doubt as how that war one your friend come out savage enough and shied a bucket at her you would have laughed i did to see the old hussy hain up her tail and dance across the rond like as if she enjoyed the fun too the wind meanwhile has been increasing our craft has all the sail she can carry our leeward plankway is under water a sudden squall a regular roger for which our men are prepared strikes us and heavy rain drops down from an overcast sky some yachtsmen ahead are not so fortunate they have run aground they hail us as we pass them but we are going too rapidly to be able to give them a helping hand now a bridge rises up ahead of us with a single low arch stand by the winch jem now lower my hearty and let her go down rattles the great tanned wing the parrel is taken off and the jaws of the gaff moved aside jem now casts off the fall of the forestay tackle from the cleat on the block balanced so well that a child could sway it in its tabernacle the great mast sinks slowly down as the ton and a quarter of lead on its heel rises into view the skipper's hand is on the tiller and with his keen blue eye he judges to an inch his bearings straight through the arch like an arrow the good vessel shoots with barely a foot to spare above head so nicely too has the time been judged that our mast has but reached its level when our bows have entered the archway no sooner is our helm clear than the mast is raised and the sail is up and we are on again as fast as ever indeed we've scarcely lost way at all pass we eel babbers on their way to some favourite babbing ground for the night's fishing on past mills and houses between long thin beds of reeds and sedges each turn in the river bringing to view fresh aspects and presently we find ourselves nearing our destination a passenger boat crowded with excursionists goes by us its screw throbbing and churning up the dark waters leaving in its wake 
a great curling swell that licks the crumbling bank on either side and follows the boat in its progress these excursion boats are doing immense damage to our river banks we are not left standing long at the village staith ere our artist friend rose up in his little dinghy stepping gingerly in we are very soon on our way to his floating domicile the wind has lulled considerably and the rain has ceased to fall all around looks fresh and beautiful and the setting sun as if loath to leave the world without a parting smile paints the west with a glow of red and golden a swan comes fussily up ruffling his snow-white plumage and threatens us with every mischief only he fails to keep his promise his mate with a brood of dark downy cygnets is beside yon reedy bank a couple of flappers or young ducks start out from a clump of rushes and take a short flight across the broad sedge birds are piping their last short songs of the day a heron trailing its long thin legs behind it has taken to wing at our approach his great awkward wings bearing him away to some quieter location on our right stretches a patch of water lilies their large flat leaves covering thickly the surface of the water there are the great open flowers white as the snows of winter lifting their beautiful heads above them here in the glorious morning sunshine in mazy flight dance and coquette many an insect whilst blue metallic carnivorous dragonflies take erratic flights amongst them and the swallows dash hither and thither great cautious roach prowl below in search of larvae the former scrupling not to make a snatch at some insect momentarily resting upon the water coots and moorhens which clicked and croaked all day long in the shelter of the reeds and sedges are mustering their chicks around them and venturing out into the open water starlings are settling in the reeds for their night's napping what a murmur as of the sea their wings make among the reed stems as our oar accidentally sweeps through the outside edge the first broods of the sand martins will soon drop in and share their strange roosting places with them reed warblers are singing all over the broad and a sedge warbler here and there joins in with a louder melody overhead the nocturnal bat shows his frittering wings dimly against the waning light the cockchafers for which he seeks in droning flight are out on their nocturnal rambles the barn owl and the field mouse on which he preys are afield together the creak of the land rail becomes familiar the stars twinkle out one by one and the moon peers from behind the ribbon clouds whose edges she has been tinging with silver a slight breeze rustles soothingly through the reeds and sedges fanning our cheeks with its cool breath as it passes by us we have been watching many of these changes from the stern sheets of our artist friend's houseboat the dinghy is moored astern of us meanwhile he has been lighting a fire and preparing a jolly little supper to complete the evening's enjoyment the smell of provender and the refreshing aroma of tea filters out into the quiet air and rouses us from our reverie for while he has been busy we have been left to enjoy our silent vigil what a proper spread to be sure and what a knobby home-like cabin in which to spoil it let us describe our ark's interior as you enter you are obliged to stoop for the ceiling does not admit of standing on either side is a settle which runs the length of the cabin on them are soft hay cushions by day they are loungers 
at night they serve as beds and mattresses the foundation of all is a great old fishing smacks boat more knocked about than worn out on the rough north sea a bit of timber strengthened here and there and she answered famously beneath the settles are a number of lockers in which various household utensils find storage a stove faces you as you enter from the stern sheets upon its magic bosom our friend works wonders in the line of cooking the cabin is double boarded and snug cupboards fill up the corners of it and within them are stowed the crocks and some other essentials for use and comfort a swing lamp and ditto table a tiny clock and an aneroid barometer form the articles in suspension to which may be added a fishing rod and a fowling piece for use when legitimate occasion offers the grainer and painter have added much to the general appearance supper over and such a supper and appetite to boot for the broadland air is provocative of the latter we turn in and wrapping our austrian blankets around us sleep as only tired folk at peace with god and all men can do but it is late ere oblivion enshrouds us for pleasant gossip goes on until speech becomes incoherent and nature gives in altogether we are not without floating neighbours astern of us lie moored a couple of small yachts covered by canvas awnings beneath them are sleeping two parties of lusty young students who are doing the broads in quest of health and pleasure after months of wearying toil and study such is a summer's night spent in broadland we wake an hour or so after midnight and steal out to take a peep at what is going on around us skylarks are already welcoming the dawn of the peaceful sabbath one is actually aloft but it is yet too dark to discern him the moon is hidden again but the stars are yet glistening in the firmament their reflex making the waters look cold and silvery gradually the dawn steals over the face of nature the small birds are waking and the bats are still flitting as if loath to turn the night into day the crowing of cocks sounds afar and near and the snoring of our artist friend inside sounds nearer and louder black-headed buntings are turning their morning songs and the twitter of the swallows announces their search for an early breakfast by three o'clock the stars have become dim and the blue sky above is streaked with purple and crimson in bunches the starlings are quitting the reed bed and the quiet waters in which the big brown pokers of the bulrushes are reflected become agitated with concentric rings as the large fish rise at the flies upon the surface the cry of the red shank and the harsher note of the heron are heard as they change their feeding quarters the trained ear of the naturalist distinguishes other bird cries the monotonous ding dong of the bells in the village belfry is summoning man to worship his creator the quiet of the country on the morning of the sabbath is delightful clad in their best apparel rustics old and young are wending their way towards the sanctuary round the porch of the old grey church stand and gossip many of the simple villagers politics and agriculture and the troubles and doings of each and his neighbours come in for a share of harmless discussion until the parson makes his appearance when hard horny hands make clumsy salutations and they follow the good man inside bewitching strains of organ and boyish voices mellowed by the obstructive walls and windows fall on our ears and awaken hallowed feelings 
as we leave the man of god to lure to brighter worlds and lead the way hearken to those familiar words hark hark my soul angelic songs are swelling o'er earth's green fields and ocean's wave-beat shore how sweet the truth those blessed strains are telling of that new life where sin shall be no more angels of jesus angels of light singing to welcome the pilgrims of the night oh how these beautiful words as the verses go on touch our hearts a tear steals down our artist friend's cheek surely the words and these sweet voices are recalling sunny and mayhap sad memories that old hymn has touched a very tender spot in his noble soul we link our arm in his and stand silently beside him we care not to break in upon holy thoughts and emotions by conversation presently we find ourselves inside the house of god our artist friend has some letters to write in the afternoon hence we pull to the village stave alone bent upon attending service at the ranters chapel as such places are yet occasionally called in our remoter hamlets tis over yinder by that big old elm tree follow your face down yon loke then turn at the bottom and you'll find it close against the village smithy so directs us a tousle-headed urchin with a hedge sparrow's nest in his sunday cap and a cane suggestive rent down the leg of his breeks sounds of lusty singing from a cottage-like building with martin's nest stuck in its windows are sufficient to denote the purpose for which it was erected hark the gospel news is sounding grace for all is rich and free reassuring us that the primitives unmistakably worship there we are ushered into a pew as plain as was ever put together by nails and hammer most of the seats are occupied sons of toil and their wives and kindred earnestly worship their maker in song song that stirs the heart rather than softens it that makes the soul feel strong and aggressive and that refreshes it a shuffling of feet upon the sandy floor follows the finishing of the hymn red handkerchiefs dot the hard cold pamets and sturdy knees bow humbly before him who readeth the hearts of all men an aged brother bent with the weight of years who occupies the tub of a pulpit pours out his prayer before him his stentorian voice is drowned at times by the louder responses of those below every one save some fidgety youngsters in a corner appears profoundly devout one of these is brought to his senses by a box on the ears administered by one whose duty seems to be to preserve order the urchin evidently has been expecting this for he takes it as a matter of course and winks an adjournment at his companions until farmer giles has settled for his usual nap our friend in the pulpit apologizes for the non-appearance of the local appointed for conducting the day's services and takes them over himself rather than let the time pass unimproved his explanatory reading of the parable of the sower a favourite one of his and one which he has given them more than once before meets with general approval one and another good brother putting in an idea which considerably enlivens the proceedings his remarks are practical as well as pungent more hearty singing follows then comes the text friends he says shutting the open bible with a bang you'll find it in the Daniel, chapter five part of the twenty-second worse 
my god hath sent his angel and hath shet the lion's mouths adding and ha kibbered up their teeth as a supplementary text of his own here the trial of dannel is graphically detailed interspersed with many original ideas and no end of quaint norfolk jargon evidently our friend reads his newspaper for your rustic has learned to think for himself even the aged who are behind the village times plod on in the wake of more eager steps of the rising generation he like many another rural dissenter while showing proper deference and respect to the squire and parson has long enjoyed the benefit of his theological convictions and whilst there is nothing of the socialist in his creed he loves and advocates freedom of thought and believes in the equality of all men at least before him who created them but to the sermon here is the gist of it dan'l were put in the wery topmost bough of the social tree because he was reckoned the wery best man to hold hisself on it he were teetotal as every christian should be a man as were sich kept a clear head and could run a straight afar than him as got fuddled at the king's arms or the rising sun and the king didn't go about with his eyes shut then jealousy like a bed of nettles crops up and makes it warm for poor old dan'l what don't folks do when jealousy's got fairly rooted then that paper what they got the king to put his name to what fools folks make of theirselves when they sign anything athwout proper thought and consideration them lions were kept to claw up folks as we keep rope to hang them as had done crimes too awful for em to remain on the earth the martyrs knowed summer about lions did dan'l give up prayin not he he didn't put off his prayers till he got a twin the blankets and then slept on em he weren't afraid to join in the prayer meetin for fear folk should hear him he opened his winder some on us would a banged it to and drawed the blind dan'l didn't then they tiptoed under the window and heard him all right says they dan'l we've got ye darius done his best for him and didn't think no more of the tattlers for their spite and tell-talin they'd heard dan'l and there weren't any breakin of the law of the medes and prussians why didn't dan'l be careful couldn't god hear a whisper of course he can but that weren't it it were stickin to principle darius whispered in his ear words of good cheer i reckon them fellows got the keepers to forget them lion suppers a day or two aforehand in they popped him how them big men stared when them ravenous beasts felt a lickin instead of eatin dan'l god sent his angel if dan'l prayed upstairs i reckon he didn't give up now darius had a rough night on it a guilty conscience were wuss and sleepin on a heap o sheep hurdles or under a harrer he was a early riser next mornin and comin to the gratin wind out dan'l are you there or are you eatin up dan'l said all right governor i'm all serene god has sent his angel and friends ain't god shet the lion's mouths for you full many a time a chorus of answers in the affirmative follows the question if the lions only dan'l says the king you must out with him so dan'l were hauled out all right and ready for his breakfast but the wuss were yet to come his enemies were hulled in and made breakfast for them starvin lions and friends 
ain't it true that the sins of the fathers is wisited on the little uns ah friends i allers pities the innocent little uns and note you them as dig traps for others generally fall in theirselves i once knowed a keeper put a shot into a fox as were about to spring on a hare had he not been out of the hare he'd not a been shot most likely our parson's lessons drawn from the narrative are first it ain't allers easy work to sarve god second if we want to be good and prosperous in this world and the next we must be prying people third it is allers best to take our troubles and our cares to god for he'll send his angel to shut the lion's mouths another night on the broads an early row round and a dip in the cool fresh waters and away are we hurried in the rumbling train to the worries and bustles and responsibilities of the workaday world End of chapter seven chapter eight of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain august in broadland oh the gallant fisher's life it is the best of any tis full of pleasure void of strife and tis beloved of many for our skill breeds no ill but content and pleasure by isaac walton the fair warm days of august dawn upon ripening fields that are white unto the harvest the sound of the wetting of scythes becomes as familiar in the countryside as the chirping of sparrows in the hedgerows and the hum of bees among the gaudy wild flowers there is little time for leisure just now at the farm for hodge and farmer giles his master are taken advantage of the weather every fine day has become precious the depredations of the swarming birds and the fear of sudden storms make it imperative that the fields should be shorn of their wealth and beauty with all possible haste it has been market day to-day and one by one as their stalls have been stripped of the produce of the coop and garden patch and the output of the dairy the country folk have harnessed their horses and turned their heads homewards it is a pleasing sight on a market morning to see the heavily laden carts with springs strained to their very utmost piled up with the good things of this life coming rumbling into town those who hold the reins and those who sit beside the driver are more quaintly dressed than picturesque and the broad norfolk patter they dispense in the market-place is quainter still behold us in the afternoon of a hot august day jog-trotting along upon a tough old vehicle that has rattled backwards and forwards these many years the painter has not seen it since it first left his hands a towy-headed rustic with a broad-brimmed felt hat turned down in the orthodox fashion has the reins and old nelson whose pace in spite of threats and persuasions has not altered one whit since we started is shambling doggedly along the good man's missus is sitting on our right between two such substantial mortals we feel quite small we may not describe her habiliments they are more than half a century behind the city fashions our driver takes great pains to point out with his lashless whipstalk everything that he imagines of interest to us from the churches and parsonages which peer out from between crowding trees to the barley in the harvest field that is ready for the carting 
his talk is of all that is rural and of not a little that isn't boar he says farmin ain't what it were when i was a youngster there's a heap of things as have altered since the good old days long ago when gleaners picked up the stray ears and harvest home were one of the sights and most pleasant doin's of the country lor the poetry's all knocked out of it what with the bringin in of machinery and the buyin up of corn from them foreigners the hull thing's got transmogorified time was when the sickle and the scythe could do what were required but folks had got a sight to go ahead nowadays and now you must have a heap of machines a cutting out labour and doing the thing so grandly but sorry times had dawned on us for all that air and ain't likely to batten while them americans and russians send their ships with many a ton and do it cheaper too the villagers had got behind hand too for many a labourer leaves em for the towns but there bore you know as much about that and the evil days we've lived to see as i can tell yer of em good arternoon mrs gammett is the salute he treats an old lady to who is alternately whacking and jerking the reins of a scraggy and ancient donkey that is slowly trundling the aged soul along mrs gammett has been to the town for her washings as the baskets of linen piled up in her little cart bear witness it was early morning when the obstinate dicky left his stable in which he hopes to munch his supper by nightfall the surviving folk of an almost obsolete generation take things easier than the present and live the longer for their unambitious jog-trot doubtless mrs gammett bids us ah noon and amidst her heaps of linen essays a little curtsy ere we get our supper at the marshman's quiet cottage we ramble out into the dusty lane we could not loiter to admire the campions dotting the hedge banks with their whites and pinks or the pale pink bells of the bindweed there is a perceptible decrease in the number of wild flowers those which are yet unfolding their petals are bright and gaudy here we find the stately corn blue bottle the scarlet pimpernel yellow hawkweeds spreading mallows scarlet poppies and many another insects of many species dance to and fro above the flowers and the low-flying swallows and martins are busy snapping a supper from amongst their heedless swarms there is a promise of rain dark patches of cloud scarcely larger than a man's hand are hastening up from the western those behind growing larger and lumpier as they journey towards the east the dust is lifted from the roadway with the puffs of wind that fitfully travel before the advancing shower and whirl it upon the hedges enveloping the passer-by in its dirty shroud the fir trees sway to and fro as it increases and the willows flutter their pennon leaves as if eager to catch the hastening raindrops high overhead some great grey gulls are shaling in erratic flight making seaward at the broadside the reeds and sedges are swaying and bending before the breeze rustling their stiff leaves and tall stems against each other till a murmur like the waves beating upon the seashore falls on the air the few remaining leafless stems of an older growth crackle and fall one by one to float a while as a tanker and then to sink beneath the surface and find burial in the waters as their predecessors did before them the sedge birds have ceased their merry warbling and chirp discontentedly 
feeding and perching have become hampered and irksome in the troubled reed clump the rain patters down in a smart drenching shower out on the broad the coots and moorhens are revelling in the shower bath the grebe and its striped progeny paddle out boldly into the open it is unpleasant tramping and crouching beside the hedgerows they afford but a sorry shelter and the finer particles from the baffled raindrops filter through the thorn sprays the briar smells all the sweeter for the refreshing moisture and vegetation in general that wash the dust and dinginess from the myriad leaves the wild flowers are gayer too they will be smiling and looking at their best with the return of the sunshine how the wind shakes the stiff old oak branches and flutters the dark green ivy leaves that spring out as if from its gnarled trunk note yon splendour pied wagtails nimbly running by that roadside puddle the rain troubles them little so long as it washes the gnats and midges within reach of their mandibles the rooks upon the old elm trees are not nearly so well pleased it is a sorry time they are having while the rough wind is shaking the twigs and grass bents from their family mansions with drooping and bedraggled wings they are hoping the squall will soon have passed and that another hour's grubbing may yet be done before nightfall the songbirds have ceased their merrymaking even the lark has dropped in the stubble dispirited and has finished his song but the wind is subsiding the thick clouds have parted and streaks of blue peer through with the sunlight the storm is over dead twigs lie scattered along the roadway the roadside hollows are filled with turbid water raindrops hang from leaf and flower sparkling with the lustre of so many pearls and diamonds the birds are again joyous and many are warbling their delight in a song of gladness there is a rainbow in the east and the sinking sun is kissing all nature into a blush of beauty tints of purple and gold gather in the west and a crimson glow paints the horizon as he slowly recedes from view the harvestmen who have been standing up for shelter are hastening homeward our old friend jim trett amongst them it is almost needless to say we enter into a friendly confab which finishes at the broad margin where we take leave of him to enjoy a quiet half hour in the gloaming and quietude of evening it were intensely quiet but for the varied sounds which nature makes around us there is quite a riot indeed in the reed bed the crowding starlings are squabbling for roosting places for the night bunch after bunch have been dropping in this half hour they have filled their crops with grubs and beetles have executed their characteristic gyrations in the air and would settle to nap till early morning but each fresh company on arrival disturbs its luckier companions who protest against the invasion of their rights the moorhen's harsh croak is frequent and other less familiar notes are heard at intervals the tuik of the partridge resounds in the fields and the soft cooing of the turtle dove issues from the leafy wood the hirundines are still dashing to and fro a small wading bird flies past us uttering a peculiarly shrill piping cry which we recognize as that of the green sandpiper a freshly fied out dyke we passed has had some attraction for it no doubt this species loves to hunt among the debris of the ditches hearken to that queer jarring sound it is like the shaking of a rattle 
or the turning of a rope maker's wheel it is none other than a fern owl or nightjar doing his best at an even song moths had need wear fern owl for his capacious mouth makes sepulchre for the largest of their race the busy door hawk chases the white moth with burring note the bats and owls are rousing themselves in the village steeple they will be out ere many a diurnal creature has tucked its head under wing or curled up its furry body for its nightly sleep big fish are rolling near the surface as if in play and many a luckless fly is snapped up as it floats across their vision the distant boom of a fowling piece is now and again heard the wild fowler is lying in wait for flappers or young ducks whose young lives trickle out with their blood their first short flights across their native broad are often fatal to the species supper in the marshman's cottage we may not dare dwell upon but the enjoyable feast over we turn into our sleeping quarters and leaving ourselves to the care of him who neither slumbers nor sleeps are soon in the realms of nod heedless of the bright pale harvest moon shining through the latticed windows with the honeysuckle making strange patterns in the shadows that fall upon our coverlet it is an early rising lark that is up before us in the morning the martins twittering in their rude clay huts above our window have scarcely peeped out to welcome the sunrise ere we are doing the same a jolly day's fishing is in prospect for the wind bids fair and the fish are well upon the feed then we have some lady friends coming to broadland to-day and if we can but persuade them not to be fidgeting about and wanting to pull here and there and sing and laugh our happiness will be complete but ladies for sure are never so restless as when upon the water they must gather bulrushes and reeds and pluck the yellow iris and those lovely water lilies and they the ladies are irresistible and what man is there who dares disregard their imperative demands on our way to the village station to meet them we encounter an individual whose doings interest us he is a little old man of sixty summers at a guess there is a dash of something superior about him we edge him into a chat and find him communicative he hails from a neighbouring city i'm from norwich sir i'm norwich bred and born a good old city that with its forty churches and its hundred thousand folk and a better people take them on the whole you'll not find in old england what do i mean by that i'll tell you sir there is not a more unclannish folk they're open-hearted free and always ready to give a hand to an unfortunate fellow citizen i won't say more or you'll think i'm clannish what am i well i do anything just now they call me the fern man and it's ferns you see to-day i'm gathering here's lady ferns spleenworts and prickly shield ferns many folks have a taste for this kind of wild plant and what looks better in a dingy back yard than a nicely arranged fernery you see sir it's like this i wasn't brought up to this kind of thing i am a comp by trade a printer you know but getting my right hand crippled see it in the machinery i was of no further use i met with much kindness but you know you can't live always on it at least i couldn't and after turner micawber for a time i thought twas time to turn up something for myself 
i was always gone on botany and natural history in general so thinks i when i saw some ferns in a hedge one day here's just it so getting a ped i filled it and leaving a bit of pride behind me started business i soon cleared out and that's how one thing led on to another in the various seasons i hunt for watercresses ferns primroses sweet briar and other wild flowers taken commissions for gathering specialties for cooped up folks who have tastes akin to my own why only today i'm taking home this bundle of dandelions for a herbalist and this bunch of wild plants to a botanist who particularly wants them and hasn't time to come himself i met with a stroke of luck not long back i found a species of orchis they named it gorgiera repens it was growing amongst some firs they said it was imported with the trees from scotland where did the luck come in why with the crown that followed i don't confine myself to green stuffs anything in the way naturalistic that turns up i take it on oh by the by i've a splendid snake here here he is i tied him in this little bag i heard a funny squealing just behind a hedge i peered cautiously through and saw a sight that much interested me it was a wretched frog that was protesting this snake had got him by the leg the frog was kicking in a dazed sort of way as if he felt it was all over with him one leg was down the reptile's throat the other hind leg was free it was really exciting to see and i stayed to watch the finale which came about eventually in the frog's going down poor thing and this swelling in the snake shows how far on his travels the four-legged reptile's gone as yet the squirming grass snake is replaced in his bag and the heavily laden little man plods on again and his tongue keeps equal pace natterjack toads and common toads i never pass by sir for many folks like them in their gardens and their greenhouses where they earn their living snapping up insects newts and lizards i've a market for and the tenants of the ditches have to mind their peas and coos when aquaria need replenishing much more does the old man say which space forbids to detail after a jolly walk we find ourselves afloat we shall not expect to see many bearded tits or wild fowl or coots or moorhens or to have the willing company of many a little reed loving songster to-day for other warblers in the boat will do the singing and snatches of familiar boating songs will be the order of the day no doubt and is it not well in every sphere of life that the ladies are more volatile than men why bless you phlegmatic man has much to be thankful for when light-hearted hopeful sunshiny woman throws her pretty shadow across his pathway the plumy tufts of the now perfect reeds nod in the breeze and the tall pokers of the bulrushes bend to peep at their reflex in the clear waters below them and the water lilies spreading their great green leaves and opening their snowy flowers put the finishing touches to many a lovely corner of broadland we make for one end of the broad behind whose reedy margin rise low hills of cultivated land the water round us has a greenish tint into it we quietly drop our huge flintstone anchors the view from the stern of the boat is pretty there is a maze of little islands which look like floating flower beds water hemlocks water plantains 
purple loosestrife and the pink willow herb show up their large green leaves and pretty flowers in profusion and the pointed spear leaves guard the pale yellow irises sedges and reeds and rushes with dark green alders and willows fill in the background our tackle and rods are soon put together ground bait is thrown over and we seriously settle to angling we have for our factotum shipped a native who at once becomes a guide philosopher and friend and it is due to him that much of the flightiness of our lady friends tones down into something akin to real interest and earnestness for his amusing dialect and store of local information win their attention and their love of novelty he unreels much that others of his kith and kin have already told us of the birds and of the fens and fen folk although to him the days when the ruffs and reeves and many another present-day rarity were common are nothing more than the traditions of his elders yet he has had sport in his time why bless ye he'd known the broads for as hard as wolf flints in the winter and has seen fowl and swans in oceans driv this air way by bad weather and a flyin round and round the place regular hard up for grub and water once and only two winters ago he says i done a stroke of shootin as many an old gunner would a thought worth a doin in the old times it had blowed and snood for a couple of days and there sir you had a splendid bite just now you've got him i told you so we strike and haul out a big slimy bream but not before he has given a little bit of protest and made his exit from his native haunts a warning to the friends he has left forever unless they be heedless and share a like untimely fate i was saying sir it snood lor the heavens were black as thunderclouds and the broad were kibbered with a couple of feet of ice old prickleback thacker and me got leave to do a day's shootin on the ice the gent at the hall being a bit partial to me and we went up there with our old eight bores and a hatchet up and down the poor buds was flyin and as soon as they seed the open patch of water and some chaff we'd thrown in a floatin on it in they plumped we were ahind a heap of faggots and if you believe me we blazed away several times pickin up near twenty pokers or potchards a dozen wild duck and mallard several teal and amongst em a number of rattle wings or golden eyes and a lovely black and white weasel duck what you'd call a smoo we filled a sack didn't say much about it and sold em at a decent figure at a norwich poulterer's you've got a fish lady now then let me shove the net under steady a bit keep the line taut now wind up a bit now we've got him and as nice a perch it is as i've seen for a wery long chalk if it ain't a two-pounder my name ain't Sharman nothing more out of the common falls a prey to the allurements of our well cleansed lobworms bream mostly under a pound in weight chance time one above it a few heedless little roach and now and then a perch or a succession of them make our floats dance and vanish there is fun galore though what is fun to you is death to us the hapless fish might tell us even the squeamishness of the fair sex vanishes in the excitement of the pastime and the most fugitive thought that anglers savours of the cruel and the ungodly appears to have flitted also may we not have felt like old walton in his vindication of an angler's innocence or so our lord was pleased when he fishers made fishers of men where 
which is in no other game a man may fish and praise his name in the meantime sharman has been most graciously communicative there ain't much as beat fishin when the fish'll bite sir and we ain't doin badly this mornin why i've took fooks on here afore and fished the whole day out athwart a sorry scale comin up how many fish have we got in broadland well let me see there's over a score i'll run em over perch yellow bream roach rowd or rud silver bream ruffs that's one you now hold in miss minners or minnows gudgeons pikes some on them warpers tench and miller's thumbs them's all common then there's crucian carp and the t'other carp which is as artful as a lawyer and trout higher up the river them i know on and i've heard say there's loach and perhaps a few chub and maybe one or two more but i ain't seen em and seein's believin ain't it i ain't mentioned eels well you don't hardly call em fish what are they then why eels in course there's two sorts o them law tis a pity we norfolk dumplins can't make good use on em when we've caught em seems such a pity to chuck a catch of three or four stone on the bank to feed the flies and rats with and breed the most fearful stenches they tell me in some parts they make em a credit to the frying pan i don't see why we shouldn't have better kinds of fish introduced suffin as we can eat just you'll try your cook with a couple of bream sir if she don't chuck em to the cat and fry you a haddock instead my name ain't sharman you see they don't fare to know how to make em tasty fish are queer uns they have whims and fancies just like christians and are a sight more knowin than we think em such is a sample of our factotum's extempore lecture the man seems a kind of talking machine and a broadland encyclopedia in one as most of your fenfolk are when fellow feeling makes us kin but once break through that thin crust of reserve and edge them out of their monosyllables and they unwind to an extent that is surprising reader did you ever escort a lass to the railway station after a day's frolic in the country you know what packages went out and what an increase alas came back again such bundles of flowers and reeds and grasses and what not you were glad when your faltering footsteps reached the station threshold pity us then with a brace of them with a weight of our own paraphernalia and some of the largest of the fishes for they've determined to cook them cook them mark you and then those bundles and yet we have some pleasant recollections of that delightful august day in the broadland End of chapter eight chapter nine of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September in Broadland When autumn scatters his departing gleams, Warned of approaching winter, Gathered, play the swallow people. By Thompson The glories of the Broadland summer are on the wane, Yet September is one of our most delightful months, and though the beauties of flora are not so widely broadcast pomona is smiling upon her ruddy orchards there is a decided change creeping over the face of nature many of the birds of summer are on the move 
and the sounds which greeted the ear in the longer days are replaced by a different order the harvest is ended the fields are shorn of their beauty and the thatcher has all but completed his roofing in of the corn stacks the weather is yet warm and balmy the sportsman is out with dog and gun in the stubbles and farmer giles and hodge are putting their thrashing machines in working order much of the poetry of country life is obsolete the flail is no longer heard upon the thrashing floor and the gleaners are among the shadows of the past there is little in the hum of machinery to awaken the poet's muse and behindhand broadland has followed in the wake of the more advanced agricultural districts an early september morning finds us hastening on our way into the land of the broads we are our own geus for the nonce for the modern bike has usurped the place of yacht and horse and railroad there is much professed appreciation of the beauties of the surrounding country from the saddle of a safety but the temptations to hurry the obscuring tendencies of dust and the several other obstacles to observation that are obviously incidental to it make such statements doubtful for the eyes and the mind are much too preoccupied to allow them to wander far aside one wants to dawdle and to mardle or gossip in the lanes as the bees do among the flowerets to extract interest from them we have turned our backs upon the sleeping town whose streets have been handed over to the drowsy policeman and the sweeper the town sparrows have only just hopped down upon the roadway the late broods of house martins are twittering in the doorways of their rude clay tenements the shrill cry of the swift is no longer heard above head and the swallows will be congregating to-day upon the elevated electric wires discussing their approaching journey southward as we glide along the turnpike sounds of bird life betoken that the feathered tribes are beginning their daily avocations snatches of song are indulged in by the thrush and blackbird whose domestic cares and worries are again ended and if that sweet mellow song we now heard is not the roundelay of the woodlark we are very much mistaken the dew is still upon the hedgerows and the grass beneath them the big nets of the geometric spider suspended upon the thorny sprays are beaded with diamond drops that sparkle in the sunlight and the stubbles are interlaced and covered with the filmy flakes of gossamer yon partridges hastening towards the shelter of the herbage at the hedge side are not well pleased with the close shorn fields if the foliage of the trees was beautiful when the year was younger it is far from unlovely now when tinted and bedecked with the colours of autumn a few of the leaves have fallen and many are fading and will ere long become a part again of mother earth the naturalist to whom all life is dear sighs and regrets that we all do fade as a leaf yet feels assured and satisfied when he remembers that a new life will dawn again when the snows of winter are ended there are but few wild flowers enlivening the monotony of the hedge bottom in which the yellow bracken is spreading its big serrated frondage the fleabane dots the coarse herbage with yellow and the clinging festoons of the great bindweed are hanging out their pinky white flower bells the purple nightshade is flowering freely and the honeysuckle above it is yet adorning the hedges with its sweetly scented sprays the hawthorn berries are assuming a ruddy hue the old fir trees behind them are heavy with their myriad seed cones 
while here and there the taller birches and oaks and ash trees cast their shadows over them by the time we are fairly within sight of the broads the country folk are stirring the clanging of the anvil at the village smithy rings out clearly in the quiet morning faint blue smoke curls upwards from low chimneys there is scarcely sufficient wind to scatter it or to turn the sails of the quaint old mill in the centre of the hamlet there is not a ripple upon the river that meanders slowly by and in whose clear depths the houses and the white sails of the yacht moored at the little stave are graphically reflected a couple of yachtsmen on the bank are preparing for their morning dip a mile beyond us lie spread the waters of the broad we walk our safeties uphill staying a moment beside a stile to take a glimpse at a furzy knoll and the spreading landscape beyond it we clamber over to examine a gaudy wildflower that has attracted our attention a wheat ear starts up from a slight depression wherein it has been hunting for ground-loving spiders perches daintily upon a fur spray flicks its tail and darts away again to some fresh location making its white rump conspicuous in its splitting there are a number of others which are congregating ere they make for the downs of sussex on their way to cross the channel there is a host of linnets small flocks of them are already working southward from the northern moors our homebred birds are congregating the bird catcher evidently knows it yonder is one of the fraternity let us beard him he salutes us with a nod and mornin gentlemen and then resumes the attitude of attention with his pull-over cord in one hand and the string which works his trigger bird in the other the calls of his cage decoy birds have announced the arrival and passing over of a parcel of linnets the man's face is all animation as he pulls the lever of the trigger up and down and the little bird braced upon the end of it flutters its wings in order to keep upon its perch down go the poor creatures into the fatal space between the clap nets which are instantly pulled up and over upon them farewell forever sweet liberty and fair scenes of early days and friendships let us describe the birdman's surroundings and his stock in trade firs bushes and thistles dot the outlook for several acres on an open space two huge oblong nets are so spread that when pulled by connecting cords and stakes the area between them is covered by the turning over of the twain inside are spread a quantity of chickweed and other dainties beloved of linnets which form his principal catchers upon a couple of long twig levers a linnet and a goldfinch are generally fastened a piece of kid glove cut something like a pair of braces and known as such is placed around each bird and by means of an eyelet below each is fastened to the stick the jerking of these up and down attracts the passing migrants around the net are placed little sentry boxes of cages in which flutter a well-trained series of linnets goldfinches siskins and such like each of whom saluting the wild individuals of its species too often unwittingly lures them into a like captivity and now the man finds he has a tongue and to a question or two gives somewhat evasive answers but presently over a well-filled pipe thaws into conversation and becomes communicative what bards do i usually catch well bore it's mostly linnets that i'm arter but i ain't particular 
if i can trap a few draw waters or goldfinches as well which pay better than any others abedivines or siskins and red poles they pay for the ketchin too but law there ain't near the bards there war when i was a youngster not of the sort as i want anyhow why i've ketched eight and ten dozen cock linnets in a mornin where i takes only one or two nowadays i s'pose the choppin up of fuzz bushes by the knockerball golfers ha cleared out some of their breedin places i know for sartin they hev at yarmouth where ketchin's about done for and maybe us fellers though i say it myself have summat reduced the stock and no wonder when ye reckon up the hundreds of thousands we're trapped say for the last ten year look at them draw waters why they've come as scarce as lion shillings where they used to be as common as sparrows but keep yo quiet here's suffin a comin and suffin does come but refuses every call and enticement to enter the fatal area after wheeling round once or twice the parcel of wary birds fly onward they've been pulled out afore and her growed artful what do i do with my birds well i have regular buyers up in whitechapel as takes all i like to send em at so much the dozen one feller takes every mortal thing i like to send him songbirds and any other sort as is stupid enough to patternise my nets and i've ketched a rummin or two in my time there's one or two folks as collect bards in the town and they're crazy for to have any queerins as i ketch and pay well too for em they do let me see i've netted a richard's pibbet a white wagtail or two several shore larks and three or four lapland buntons besides some as i can't remember their names it's like this boar we know the common ones and anything as isn't common why it's uncommon do you see then we make the best market on em we can some years ago i ketched a bard as i thought were a curious linnet and sold it for a tanner or sixpence it throwed up a couple of ear wiggles in the cage what were it well i heerd arterwards as how it were a bard warbler and changed hands at four or five sovereigns that's what you get for want of education just a minute gents our catcher who is successful this time runs to make sure of half a dozen captives struggling under the nets four are let go again and the other two are placed in a darkened store cage in which a struggling mass of birds are fluttering and rasping their bills against the cruel wires poor terrified wretches them were hens as i let go he resumes they bain't much use jest now and never is cept i've got a order for shootin matches then sparrows and anything up to starlin's come in handy now i do set my foot on that sport as bein in no wise respectable and ain't it against all reason and feelings of kindliness to shoot poor things as ain't a atom a chance of escapin except when sich fellers bang away as don't know one end of a gun from t'other i wouldn't let em have em only i'm glad of the money they fetches i were a long time afore i could swallow my squeamishness over ketchin bars at all you see that right hand's crippled i got that some years ago in a thrashing machine and bein no farther use for farm work and knowin i must do summat i bethought me of a doin this look here jack saunders says i that's me you know you'll ha to do it if you likes it or not when i seed my fuss lot of birds a raspin madly at their prison bars 
a flutterin poor things to find a way out again and shrilly pipin in a scarified sort of way with wexation and terror i could ha let em all go again but i didn't for i reasoned this wise thinks i what is there as we wear and use and eat and even sleep on as wasn't at one time part of some other being as we'd robbed or killed or sich like why the wery boots i'd on my feet was once on the back of a hoss and a bullock and more than one old hin were kilt to make that feather bed then again thinks i poor critters you'll be shut up in a little cage and hung up in some stuffy alley or out of some slum winder to breathe unpure air and never see green stuffs again but then you'll gladden some poor critter's heart with your singin remindin em of years long gone by when they was country folks theirselves and makin sorryful hearts forget their sadness in the pleasant memories of the past and you'll get your grub for sure and sartin and so the squeamishness wore off and here i am a tryin to catch em still and have been these sixteen year and more i love the open country and to hear the jolly songs of the bards i never hurts em and i don't know as i'm worse than many other naturalist bloke for don't some on them catch and kill stick pins through beetles root up the wild plants knock over bards or get others to do it for em i know this ere job is looked down on but let him as is without fault hull the first stern and they mustn't chuck em as lives in glasshausen so says i much more about larks and greenfinches and a host of others is told us of their respective value and qualifications of their ways and habits the man's calling and his environment all tend to make him a keen observer of nature in her varied aspects he tells us of his other doings how that he ferrets for rats and helps to trap vermin for the gamekeepers and of a host of other odd jobs that fall to his share in the circuit of the year and that all play their part in the maintenance of his self and the old woman and in keeping em out of the workers his patter would simply fill our columns if placed therein in detail leaving our bikes in the care of the village innkeeper we find ourselves at length by the limpid waters of the broad we have been not a little amused and interested in the doughty frequenters of the old boar's head some of whom have arrived there earlier than ourselves whilst others have been dropping in as we are munching our cheese and biscuits and sipping our glasses of ginger beer big strong fellows they are with towy heads and tousled beards whose lives have been spent at the plough tail and upon the fenland their attire is more accommodating than picturesque and more grotesque than fashionable fashions alter slowly and stand for nothing in broadland save when mary ann has a few days holiday from her place and then she in her less tasty than gaudy attire becomes the transient envy of the village maidens our friends in wider wakes and fustians like their beer but generally have the good sense to avoid excess there is the usual small and tall talk that seems incidental to the pewter pot and the ale mug old yarns are spun no doubt for the hundredth time and it isn't all gospel that is dispensed in the village alehouse any more than it is in the city snug but the moral atmosphere in general is fortunately purer the latest village intelligence is sifted and dispensed in between their tippling and by the time their pots are empty each one knows that 
cadder duffel is blessed with his twenty-third baby that farmer stubbs's colt has broken its knees and that the squire's latest litter of puppies is a likely lot of critters much personal history has been raked over and even the wrong doings of parliament have been right-sided by the village snob and tailor who were here as everywhere else the most known some old fogies in the village democracy a trifling episode does much to vary this dull monotonous diurnal round of conversation an itinerant quack doctor drops in with his baggage he is trudging on his way townwards but is glad of a rest and a refresher to break the irksomeness of the journey he is a keen ready-witted fellow with an eye to business why shouldn't his halt be turned to some account straightway he begins to patter the host rests upon his elbows open-mouthed the unsophisticated rustics take in his lecture a slight wink at us passes unnoticed by the others in minutest detail every ill and many others to which mortal man is subject is expatiated upon the usual pains in the back dizziness in the head and all the fearful catalogue a hotchpotch of wisdom and eloquence chiefly strung together from circulars advertising patent medicines burly men are led to believe they must be suffering from one complaint or another or may do and big freckled hands dive deeply to where coppers are known to be in hiding boxes of the magic pills mostly concocted of soap and breadcrumbs no doubt are slipped in the places rendered vacant by them as the quack politely departs he gives us a supplementary wink which this time is caught and interpreted by the snob and tailor i'm gormed ejaculates the latter if that ere feller ain't a fraud and bolts out to tell him so but the fraud is too far on his journey again to be in any fear of immediate retribution we are once again afloat and bent on devoting the hour or so of our leisure to a jolly little sail in the trim latina that has kindly been placed at our disposal with a favourable wind we sail up and down the broad until we tire of the fun and rare fun it is too to feel yourself spinning along as if the craft beneath you were a living thing now this way and now that speeds the buoyant vessel with the water hissing around your bows and bubbling astern as you cleave the sparkling waters you feel a delightful exhilaration a pleasant excitement as you dash past swaying reeds and nodding rushes and the remnant of the water lilies part to let you speed on and on you forget a while the cares that press heavily upon you in the toiling workaday world and you return to them all the better able to cope with their stern realities the coots and the moorhens fly into the shelter of the densest reeds and wonderingly hold their peace as you bear down upon them and mayhap scandalise you with returning confidence but a continuity of pleasure like that of work and worry becomes wearisome at length and presently we glide into a secluded nook lower sails and make the painter fast we step out upon a low-lying fen we have promised to take home a few broadland plants to a botanist friend of ours here before us they lie spread in confusion unfortunately most of them have done flowering and are past their best we gather a few that we may and may not get thanked for here is the marsh sink foil one of the sundews the marsh veronica some half a dozen others complete the list for before we've had time to travel far across the shaking bog 
the weather has assumed so threatening an appearance that it is deemed advisable to make for the shelter of an old boat-house at a not far distant corner of the broad away over the ruffled surface we glide reaching the tumble-down place only just in time to avoid a pelting shower we have seen but few birds to-day rapid movement is of course prejudicial to observation and is anything but appreciated by the quiet loving creatures whose haunts we are intruding upon a few late swallows are still darting up and down but they like their prey have become perceptibly scarcer many of the sedge birds have taken their departure but while the soft-billed species are sensibly decreasing hard-billed seed-eaters are on evidence the whistle of the greenfinch the pink pink of the chaffinch and the familiar call of the linnet as small parties pass overhead are heard from time to time there is a marked absence of birdsong there is a decided quietude in the outlook too there are fewer yachts and the bulk of the anglers have already put their rods aside for the season and have shouldered the gun instead the unhappy coveys of partridges are faring badly while the corn was yet standing they had a safe and ready retreat from many of their enemies but the stubble is cut so short that it offers them a very poor hiding place and their worst enemy is out of field in search of them in the daytime they are glad to skulk in the groves and covers and at night for fear of marauding animals they seek the open the report of the gun becomes a familiar sound the boathouse is a rude structure and in a state fast verging on decay through a hole in the roof an alder is pushing its leafy branches in amongst the thatch the sparrows often make merry a pair of marsh tits are flitting and scrambling amongst the rafters they are in quest of hiding insects but we are not the only temporary tenants of the old shed a big brawny fellow with a game bag slung beside him from which the brown head of a wild duck is protruding has arrived before us his costume betrays his avocation he is a gamekeeper like most men who lead a lonely existence he is reserved and cautious but like them when once thawed into conversation becomes communicative enough it is some minutes before we are on such good terms we silently watch the downfall together reassured by the quietude the waterfowl venture out again into the open grebes and their striped progeny and coots with a younger generation nearly as large as themselves and a whole family of moorhens paddle out from the reed clump some to vanish in the one opposite the remainder to dip and play and fish until disturbed again by our unwelcome presence see them starlings our new friend queries pointing to a huge flock comprising some hundreds wheeling and manoeuvring in a most well-timed and marvellous fashion well i'm going to give them what cheer o this evenin my governor has suffered enough from them a settin on the reeds or roostin that he says i must do some execution among em you'll be astonished at the damage they do a breakin down big patches of em there's at least a quarter of an acre spiled already in that patch in front of us i don't like wholesale slaughter but a feller is paid to do his duty you will think it funny but i like em for eatin as well as i do any bird as is flyin i skin em 
cut their hinder parts away and bake em in a pie then some of them poor rogues will be in a pie tomorrow that's the one redeeming feature in the business i get laughed at for some of my notions i'm teetotal that's suffin new hereabouts in a gamekeeper not as i know many on em as a drunkards i don't want to become one so thinks i prevention's better than a cure my class you know too often get a downright love for killin almost everything they come across they think they're doing their duty and so they kill every mortal thing as they imagine is likely to do their game birds a mischief either in the egg or feather law gentlemen we've got credit for doing the biggest mischief in the way of wiping out our rarer birds and with some degree of truth i'll allow ye lost british birds have put down that to our credit there's a book you know of that name just published well i was a readin it and thinks i jack manley that's me you know ain't so bad i guess as some of his neighbours no more is his master he is doing his best to preserve some of the species and i aids and abets him for as i've thought these years past what a pity it is that our native races of birds should be wiped out as they are there's so many causes are working against em drainage and cultivation then them abominable cockney sportsmen as blaze away for killin sake only from sparrows upwards then specimen hunters as have collections too many on em neither use judgment nor common sense they'll spend a hatful of money and do anything a most to get a rare un in order to stuff it and shatter up in their crowded cases more's the shame so many of my fraternity encourage em and bows the knee to filthy lucre and glory in killin the poor doomed critters beside then the wormen we're supposed to slaughter some makes awful mistakes about them of course we're paid to do suffin but it's left a great deal to our discretion some uneducated stupid fools are dead set on barn owls why never a better game preserver could there be it's rats gentlemen rats as do more mischief to game than anything else and owls is mortal enemies to em then where comes the sense of killin them every little hawk is outlawed give me plenty of kestrel says i look there go a couple yinder and i'll wager the field mice'll not prosper kill your kestrels foster your field mice and where's your corn stacks the poor farmer is the greatest sufferer then there's bigger birds of prey as is all but extinct with us when i was a nipper hen harriers and marsh harriers weren't so scarce as now now i think hawks don't do near the harm to game as they get credit for i think like canon tristram that they're the police of nature running in in more ways than one the weaklings and the sickly healthy game knows how to take care of themselves most often if landowners and keepers was only to read up and observe and measure their brains against prejudices things would alter summat but they don't and so they kills and kills and thus clear out the innocent critters and then see what improvements have been made with guns folks must have breech loaders and what chance have birds agin em it's bang bang as fast as you like more's the pity the old muzzle loaders have had their day they did give em a chance and there was some excitement when you had to load and keep your eye about you while you did it 
disappointment in shootin from the birds sometimes escapin you made your ultimate success all the more exciting and pleasurable you see i still sticks to my old muzzler protection's doin good here gents we've more ducks than ever snipes have bred this year on the fen you was walkin over and not far away was more an one nest of ruffs and reeves to ear i didn't mind tellin you cause you ain't likely ever to disturb em a pair of bitterns laid their eggs there too but some lout of a wizitter found em i copped em jest as he'd blown em but i cracked em for him and done a'most as much to that stupid hid of his not as i did right but the law would only have fined him for trespass. There, thinks I, I can dispense better justice and do it summarily. He wanted to square me with half a sovereign. I took it, bless you, but when I chucks the half a nicker in the broad, you should have seen him look. I guess he ain't come here again in a hurry. This slaughter, in course, is good for some of the small birds which have become a nuisance sparrows in particular look here gents there's a lot as want right sidin why didn't the law protect birds eggs ain't egg collectin for instance thinned out the different plovers look at young peewits time was when we'd thousands bred here thousands of eggs were taken now what a sorry foo there are what more useful bird can you find as wipes off worms and grubs as they did then what is there nicer than seeing all sorts of characteristic birds around you but law bore tisn't no use of talkin too much of the mischief's done avocets and harriers black-tailed godwits spoonbills and bitterns has slipped us only stragglers turnin up at intervals in yon elder car i have heard my dad say blue doors or black turns bred in his younger days by hundreds we only see now a few in spring on passage and yet i live by slaughter well gentlemen that's my callin surely but though i do raise partridges and pheasants i use a little common sense in what i point my gun at and do i believe in the wholesale slaughter of game birds well i don't see no harm in it any more in killin chickens for ain't they more and half domesticated and bred a purpose a half hour's chat with this strange conglomeration of philosopher and keeper leads to many other interesting topics but time is on the wing and we say good day to the honest fellow the shower has passed over and nature has assumed a most delightful aspect we row our boat to her mooring place for the wind has failed us an aged fenman is examining his eel set as we jump ashore and we fain would edge him into gossip but the wing of time is still fluttering the loud boom of the keeper's gun bespeaks the discomfiture of the starlings which have unluckily for themselves wheeled within range of his fowling piece a bunch of wild fowl pass overhead in hurried flight a wren chatters on a sallow stump beside us at a hedge hard by it and a couple of swans are probing the muddy bottom of a little beck on our left we drop in at the blue boar to enjoy a late but welcome dinner we are this time sole occupants of the sanded parlour save for the presence of the host himself who has much to ask and much to answer and what appetites we've been acquiring two hours later and our steeds are in their usual places in our homes in the busy town 
End of chapter 9chapter ten of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain october in broadland along the woods along the moorish fens sighs the sad genius of the coming storm the wanderers of heaven each to his home retire save those that love to take their pastime in the troubled air or skimming flutter round the dimply pool by thompson a decided change has crept almost imperceptibly over broadland and the face of nature in general the eddying winds of autumn are making inroads among the sere and yellow leaves that tint the hedgerow and the woodland but which are yet beautiful to look upon even in their decay the approach of winter has already made its influence felt among the tribes of earth and air the summer birds are entirely missing the chinking notes of the redbreast become almost as familiar as the chirruping of the sparrows and the sweeter sounds that greeted us in the sunnier days have given place to harsher cries and wilder call notes the holidays are over the seaside watering places have assumed their normal appearance no longer the huge trains of joyous excursionists and the heavily laden steamboats pour forth their loads of holiday-making humanity the towns and cities have settled down again for a long spell of serious work the dwellers in the quiet country are still busy in the fields for a prospective harvest in the coming year demands their following the ploughshare and the harrow contented hodge is whistling at the plough tail his merry whoa dobbin bespeaking the completion of another furrow the white-winged craft that recently crowded the silent flowing river are absent the riverways and the lagoons of broadland are no longer ploughed by the sharp bows of the swift gliding yachts nothing but the huge tan sails of the wherries may be seen speeding their devious ways among the sedge-lined rivers and reed surrounded broads on many a sloping shore the dismasted yachts may be found there to remain until another springtime shall see them spick and span ready to glide down again into their favourite element once more we shall have a quiet run-up to-day and it is a strange little craft in which we hope to reach the broads though i say it myself says skipper bessie there ain't her likes on the broads and rivers for miles around and there ain't another as is built for the self same purpose and let get her clear of the town and you'll see what a merry little thing she is our skipper is an eel merchant and as such has been known to the fenmen far and near for the last thirty years hundreds of tons of eels have passed through his hands our vessel is simply a big ship's gig with a streak or two added to her height her sharp stem and stern and cutter rig giving her an exceedingly rakish appearance at the fall of the year when eels are running and the eel catchers are busy with their eel sets up and down she plies going empty returning full sometimes with several hundredweights in her well fore and aft the craft is buoyant indeed at the stern is a famously snug cabin in which the skipper and his man make comfortable when on their strange voyaging to and fro midway the vessel is one huge tank 
the sides of it being perforated with innumerable holes for the free ingress of water what a squirming mass of living things will be there below decks on her return it is blowing stiffly as we reach the open marshland we have a flowing tide and a famous southeaster which strengthens into half a gale ere we have been many miles on our voyage how the trim thing spins along with every stitch of canvas crowded on mainsail topsail and jib several wherries are speedily overhauled fast as they are sailing although with shortened sail and with their lee plankways under water our vessel is well ballasted and our worthy skipper knows her capabilities and we fancy is amused at our slight uneasiness for now and again she heels over somewhat unpleasantly the marsh houses the pump mills and the remnant of the cattle on the marshes flit quickly by and a bubbling eddy of white foam surges behind us the wherrymen salute us in their rough pleasant way as we pass them and throw out not unpleasant eulogies on the white-bearded skipper and his dashing polly but the wind shows signs of strengthening and it is thought best to strike the topsail yet we tear along with undiminished speed you was axin sir bessie resumes with his hand upon the tiller about their meal sets see yinder's one hangin on stacks to dry it's old billy nicholls's there's old billy hisself in the stern sheets of his houseboat a washin hisself it's time he had a scrub i reckon but law bore you can't tell mud from sun tan on them old fellers they get so coloured up by strong air and sunshine that mud and clothes and men seem all of a piece mornin billy mornin bessie returns the old man of the muds give us a call on your way back all right replies our skipper and keeps on we was talkin of eel sets sir you know as well as i do that in the fall of the year myriads of eels return to the sea from whence they came in springtime as tiny elvers no bigger and darnin needles some big naturalists tell us as how these older ones don't return i beg to differ for what's them as we catch in springtime a workin up the rivers anyway in september and october they take a fit for a sea trip and your broadman knows it and tis to his advantage to stop em so he just does his best to do it what with babbin and pickin much is done but for wagon hauls there's nothing to beat the sets in the day our real man does his snoozin at night he keeps his wits about him his eel set stretched across a river must be watched or parson craft would spoil his little game as you saw by that eel set as was dryin it ain't much unlike a trawl net like a wall of network the four parts placed athwart the stream corks keepin the top afloat lead sinkers keepin all smart below what about the wherries cuttin it well it's like this there's two or three lines fastened to the top line these run through blocks fixed to stakes in the river bottom it ain't a warm job always to keep watch at night you think but ain't your ill bloke as tough as most folk and ain't his kettle a hot tea allers on the hob if a wherryman looms up he sings out to other who slacks the rope pulls the lines and down goes the top line and there you are wherrymen know where they're set as well as the eel blokes do 
and tain't often as damage is done three or four openings in this wall of net have long eighteen or twenty foot purse nets attached which as you saw are kept open by means of hoops fastened to em these pods as they term em are laid and staked downstream their positions being marked by floats funnel-shaped fixins inside of course make it awkward for the eels to git out again return tickets aren't issued bor you may lay your hand to your heart on that sometimes they do well sometimes badly dirty weather and a wanin moon suits the business best but come down sir afore you leave us breakfast's ready and don't that kettle o tea smell jest refreshin and delicious we leave the eel merchant getting ready to resume his upriver voyage for we have been moored to a stave while breakfast was being discussed and much fish and folklore with it we wish we could have invited the reader down into that snug warm cabin and surely he would have relished the humble meal of brown bread and cheese and enjoyed it none the less for the novelty of the situation and an increased appetite nor have hesitated to wash it down with a basin of steaming milkless tea we make our way along the river bank towards the little brick bridge which spans the stream our eel man has shot it and with upraised mast and sails has again caught the breeze how the wind sways the quivering reeds to and fro now bending low as it strikes them they lower their woolly head tufts as if some giant reaper had drawn his scythe through their slender stems but a moment after they have lifted again to be swayed in another direction like the troubled waves of the wild north sea they are incessantly in motion their dry leaves rustle like the sound of shingle thrown up by the curling sea waves a heron rises with startled scream from a ditch side and lets fall an eel as he mounts upon his great grey wings and takes to flight a moorhen runs in a skulking manner upon the broken sedges that line the ditch margin jerking its funny white tail feathers and then vanishes in a clump of rushes nature has assumed a somewhat desolate appearance a pavement of decaying leaves marks where the water lilies spread their summertime beauties the iris and many another characteristic broad plant are flowerless and leaf and stem have become yellow and shrivelled the broadland botanist has all but discontinued his rambles but has plenty to do in the long evenings in arranging specimens he has already collected the alders and willows shake their decaying foliage in the blast and many a leaf falls into the debris that has been blown in a tangled mass beneath their overhanging branches the swans with their still grey signets pay scant heed to the fury of the elements a flock of wild ducks pass overhead and yonder long-billed birds dashing by sideways to the wind must be curlews their weird mellow call notes unmistakably proving our conjecture to be correct a puff of smoke from a bunch of reeds on the rond by the river is followed by the fall of one of their number the report is from none other than jim trett's fowling piece her bark as the fenman describes it is unmistakable and out from his lair the old man stalks and retrieves his fallen game we would not disturb him but the good fellow seeing us beckons us towards him that's a dinner for the old woman tomorrow 
he informs us after a shake of his horny fist and the usual salutation some folks be too particular bore and tell ye curlew ain't grand eatin but they didn't know you see it's just because they've eaten em when they weren't in their prime d'ye see this'll do bor for it's a young un and just off the northern moors where twere bred and born its grub was lobworms and insects and other bog livin critters i've heard my old dad say as how a curlew be she white or be she black she carries twelve pence on her back not as it's worth a bob to me bor anyway it ain't spoiled its flavour yet as it would soon ha done down at the sea coast on a salt water diet lay yell down look kedgy or lively and mind that polk hole or mud puddle a loud report follows the old man's sight down the long bright barrel which he has been loading during his eulogy on the curlew this time a lapwing is slain and as we peer through an opening in the reeds we see the poor thing stop short in its flight turn over and with extended wings fall like a clod upon the rond from which it rebounds several inches with the impact jim trett evidently knows well the lay of the country and that certain spots are used as leads by various wild birds here bor he resumes horn pies or lapwings or peewips as some call em generally lead this time of the year Art a feedin on them mashes or marshes behind them fir trees yinder they come back in the mornin to the uplands to preen their plumage and nap till nightfall here come two or three more i'll whistle em the fellow's wrinkled face puckers up as he imitates the hornpie's familiar cry but though they answer to it they fly wide of him we leave him to his own devices and make towards the broad after promising to drop in at eventide to discuss the merits of an old hernshaw or heron as he'd kilt the night afore on the mashes the breeze has upset jim's arrangements for the day had the weather been different he would have been out roach fishing with a gentleman who is keen upon the pastime as it is this angler he informs us had gone to the fenman shelter and jim as we saw him had made the best of matters by air and old peggy his favourite fowling piece and shootin for what he couldn't arn his dinner dropping in at the fenman shelter we find the aforesaid roach angler a plump well-nourished fussy gentleman who seems alternately amusing himself with sipping a mug of ale and munching biscuits reading a week old telegraph and peering in a fidgety sort of way out of the window at the weather we are soon on a friendly footing and the little man waxes exceeding chatty the rum fellow is that jim trett he remarks when the weather and divers other subjects have been commented upon and he's but a type of your unadulterated fenmen who alas are a generation which these days of breech loaders railways drainage and school boards will soon supersede by a mongrel following the fashion of this world passeth away i have heard our parson say and it's a downright pity that your fenman has been included in the category education in particular is playing the excuse me sir i'd nearly dropped an old-fashioned english word with a u in the middle of it havoc i mean with their strange superstitions it is weeding out many of their queer old-time provincialisms 
and will some day convert their quaint norfolk dialect into dull terse unmelodious english in marshall's rural economy of norfolk written over a hundred years ago he tells us that there is an alertness in the servants and labourers of norfolk which i have not observed in any other district then he says a lot more and in contrasting them with their kentish duplicates makes regular models of them as to manners gait and air he might have been a norfolk man himself now i don't go so far as that if i am to compare your norfolkese of then with their descendants of to-day i'll grant you it will be difficult to find others to beat them at honesty sobriety and workishness times have altogether altered too since then a hundred years ago hodge was a boarder with his master he was bred and born on the farm worked there all his days and deed there and perhaps was happier on his five pounds ten per annum and his board and lodging than he is to-day perhaps not for he's certainly freer to-day he has his franchise and can please himself in his choice of masters but then increased pay doesn't go for everything for if he gets thirteen shillings a week there has been a corresponding rise in what he has to spend times have gone against him and machinery and foreign competition have seriously handicapped him many a fine young fellows had to budge and emigrate go to sea or find a billet in the overcrowded towns those who follow the sea and alternate it with work ashore seem to do fairly well but a fisherman's calling is an uncertain affair many of the young strapping fellows are now following the north sea herring fishery here landlord bring us some eggs and bacon and a jug of coffee so orders our talkative friend while we're discussing these matters we'll improve the time and ere afternoon has arrived the wind may have dropped a bit just look at that troop of larks flying over they're norwegians immigrating to our less inhospitable climate for the winter several flocks follow in rapid succession a number of wild geese are discerned high aloft and on a hawthorn hedge across the pytel or small field a number of field fares are seen busily plucking the ripening berries and the note of the red wing is heard as to superstitions there's a lot of queer notions still afloat thank you landlord now then sir help yourself you can't get fen folk to do business on a friday those who follow the sea won't cross the bar either on that day if they can help it and as to walking under a ladder why that's equally unlucky primroses and poppies carried into a house are both bearers of bad luck and for a cuckoo to fly over it well that as leaf see the father of lies do it don't meet a cross-eyed party when you go to market better stop at home see three cuckoos on a walk and you'll have a death in the house ere long someone is sure to die if a peacock's feathers are brought into the house the hoot of an owl is more than uncanny a red bee flying in at the door or window portends the arrival of a gentleman a white bee signifies a lady i could tell you a lot more see i've quite a notebook full of folklore but the bacon's getting cold now then landlord 
some cheese and biscuits please believe me faith in witchcraft hasn't yet died out and the evil eye without a doubt blinks at times did you see the landlord spit on the floor just now he no more wanted to than i do that white horse driven by the house was the innocent cause of it it was lucky to expectorate our landlord is known as loper gray ask in the village for nathaniel and few will know him as such lope is norfolk for stride his long legs have earned him his cognomen nicknames are all the go in broadland some peculiar or curious personal characteristic or even some exploit irretrievably christens a fellow pretty mouth hewitt boxer brown grumpy johnson cadger reed and a host of others might be cited if you want to find a village notoriety make sure of his nickname rather than his family one for it may be he's known only by the former as to dress there's as much canvas and fustian about the broadman as will cover him and a broad-brimmed felt hat worn a la mephistopheles completes his rig out barring his boots and boots they are something like small cradles for size and pattern and as inartistic as an ironing box but the wind's gone down a bit what say you to a row across the broad the wind has so far spent itself jim trett said he thought it would ease when the tide ceased flowing that we can with safety venture out a few strokes and we turn a bend in the river then up a reed fringe lane of water and we are on the open broad the surface is still agitated though it matters not much to the grebes yonder diving and disporting in the cool waters they find it quiet below and the small roach crowding into the deep holes in the more sheltered bite fall an easy prey to the sharp-billed creatures we row along under the lee of a reed bed in which the clicking of the coots makes strange music a parcel of reed pheasants or bearded tits fly off from some woolly reed tufts and still more larks pass overhead the froth churned by the wind from the troubled waters drifts in amongst the floating leaves that are entangled among the reed stems a turn in the clump brings us into the teeth of the wind and veritable white horsemen splash over the boat's bows and wet our belongings we soon tire of this and make for a rond that is made gay by the blue flowers of the michaelmas daisy and fastening the boat pick our way across the squashy bog disturbing two or three snipe as we follow a foot track that winds its sinuous way across to a higher level this circuitous swampy footpath has been worn by jim trett's highlows and trends towards the good man's domicile it must not be thought that we have kept silence for our friend is irrepressible now for a rare treat in the way of food for mind and body says he for you'll get both at the fenman's cottage the wind has lulled considerably now and streaks of blue intersect the hitherto dull monotony of cloudland the rain has held off wonderfully nothing more than the merest sprinkling has fallen we sit down a while to muse and gossip our friend still unreeling his inexhaustible store of broadland folklore it is early when we enter the fenman's cottage the old lady gives us a hearty welcome mr talkative nudges us and whispers that the old gal is an original 
why mr thingamy i ain't seed ye for never i ain't how's all your family queries she as she clasps her fat freckled hand in her own wrinkled biceps sit ye down a bit tea's jest ready and jim'll be in early to-day specially as he knows ye come why here he come and what's the old fool a goldrin or laughin like that for why jim it do fair or seem funny for you to hain or lift your eyebrows like a big grinnin mother or girl you ain't so sad labor i can see as you were when you went out what's up wi ye well old woman i just now seed narber or neighbour cooper a comin home with his old dicky or donkey just as they reached loper grays it got scared and began a dancin well off come a wheel and a tub of swill as he'd gone and fetched flew off along with him down went dicky and tub and cooba into a hole or dry ditch together what with dumplin and grease and sich like well bor in all your born days never did ye see sich a sight neither for nor are and the old fellow roars again at the very recollection of it take a note of the words says mr talkative for their rail broad norfolk it is a pleasant time that we spend over at the good folks tea table jim trett having oiled his gun and hung it up and his frail basket of game the aforesaid curlew and lapwing to which has been added a mallard and having made himself presentable sits down beside us need we detail the savoury viands presented good tasty heron hot potatoes mushrooms from the marshes garden beet from the cultivated patch surrounding boiled pike and potted eel and a whopper of a blackberry pie to finish with what more we need say of them jim trett brings forth from his memory locker many a stirring adventure for there are such to be met with in broadland much that is interesting about fish and bird and animal about shooting swans and snaring pike ferreting and trapping and what not several pages in the folklore diary are scribbled full as the good man plies his yarn whilst the old lady keeps dropping her knitting upon her lap to listen for long after our appetites are satisfied does the chat continue behold us just in time at the broadland station but for narber cubitt's dicky we might have missed our train the wheel had been replaced the vagrant lichpin readjusted and both cubitt and the trap had undergone a sousing and couldn't that little dicky spin along next day's flood tide finds us leaving our houseboat at the entrance of far-famed Braden. our craft is a characteristic norfolk punt our business the slaughtering of the innocents but not so much that perhaps as observation october ushers in the great migratorial movement of the birds all our summer birds have reached warmer lands by the second week of it their places have been filled by the hardier races from the more hostile north snow buntings twites larks waxwings and a host of other land birds most as common and many rarer usurp our woodlands meadows and wastelands where the cuckoo wheat ear chiffchaff and others dwelt in summer time our mud-flats and sandy seashores resound with the varied cries of wading birds and the estuary waters are lively with the wild fowl that float upon them we cannot enter into this interesting subject for a volume alone would cover it 
the flats will soon be covered great grey gulls and immature of the black-headed species with a sprinkling of others winnow their way to and fro snatching up fragments of fish and grease floating on the surface of the brown waters yonder stalks a grey heron small flounders and juvenile shore crabs suit him just as well as the frogs and roach of fresher waters much might be said of the gradual change which has been creeping over Braden during half a century in the early part of it a number of men gained a fairly remunerative living by shooting the teal and widgeon and potchards that used to crowd here many a rare bird too like the spoonbill avocet black-tailed godwit and others fell to their guns these with black terns phalaropes and other rarities and crowds of the commoner curlews bar-tailed godwits knots and grey plovers these last three in their striking nuptial plumage dropped in in springtime on their way north and again in autumn after the duties of procreation had ended what halls before the close seasons were instituted did the hardy wildfowlers make at times but great changes have taken place in their one-time favourite habitats and now october finds us with fewer birds to shoot or look at as we drift and paddle upstream the calls of a few curlews ringed plovers dunlins and mayhap of some less common species ring out over the rippling waste of waters a short way ahead of us upon the shelving mud are half a dozen small grey birds they are about as large as doves give us the glasses what pretty little fellows they are knots what are they doing two are splashing thigh deep in the shallow washing their already spotlessly clean plumage the others are nimbly running here and there in search of red ragworms or any small unfortunate crustacean that may have been playing in a tiny puddle now they all bunch up run a short way again then turn and innocently eye us as we come within gunshot a strange wheating cry of alarm escapes one but as if still willing to trust us they remain motionless shall we fire now no let the poor things go why should we harm them we remain looking down the barrel of our redoubtable old eight bore we do not hesitate long a mallard comes whizzing past but we draw bead upon him and his fall headlong into the water follows the report we can eat him such are the tender mercies of the wild fowler End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Man and Nature on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. November in Broadland. By my caller heron, ye little ken their worth. Well, by my caller heron, O oh, ye may call them vulgar fairin wives and mithers mess despairin car them lives o men by lady nan a cold damp drizzle generally ushers in the dreariest of the broadland months november it is the month of fogs and mists and driving sleets deform the day jim trett the fenman's opinion would be that November's neither here nor there, nor one thing nor the t'other, a kind of dead and alive affair. The last remnants of the sere and withered leaves are stripped from the branches of the woodland trees, 
and they lie a natural matting to protect the tender shoots of a future generation of wild plants which love to spread their flowers in the glade and on the hedge bank flora is not dead but taking needful repose intervals of pleasant weather occasionally brighten the face of nature and the sunlight flings the shadows of the trees distinctly upon the land and we are tempted forth to lengthy rambles such a morning finds us in the train which fusses along through broadland there is scarcely a breath of wind and the rays of the morning sun are dazzling after days of storm and mist and gloom ah bore volunteers a son of old ocean who has made himself comfortable in his rough and ready fashion in the same compartment of ourselves and between whose knees dangles a string of silvery herrings this here's only a wather breeder you will just see if i ain't far out from being right goodness knows we've had a tidy spell of bad wather this month law how that blowed the early part of last week after having delivered himself of this comment he relapses a while into silence some unpleasant reminiscences mayhap are passing before his mental vision we refrain from unduly intruding upon his cogitations and peering out from the carriage window we catch a glimpse of the sea now placidly rippling and gleaming as if in its summer play as gentle as a child great gulls mostly greys the immature of the greater saddlebacks amongst which may be distinguished a few of their blacker-backed elders and several herring gulls and their smaller relatives the larus ridibundus are winnowing their way on easy pinions to and fro playfully dipping to the surface of the water to snatch up fragments of herrings and other animal refuse as their keen eyes espy them over the nearer marum covered sandhills several white-winged snow buntings are hunting for seeds of the various dune plants that flourished there in the warmer days in flight they are exceedingly conspicuous and the grey-mantled hooded crow recently arrived from the norwegian fjords loafs here and there ready to pounce upon wounded fowl or any carrion that less foul-eating creatures have passed carelessly by we might perhaps have noticed the various changes in the country through which we are being rapidly borne along but our brawny-shouldered guernsey-clad fisher friend who has distributed one or two characteristic expectorations upon the floor and replenished his capacious cheeks with a fresh section of twist becomes talkative and monopolizes our attentions nothing loth we settle to a friendly gossip and let him spin his yarn you are right boar we have had some rummy weather and only this time last week i never reckoned on coming home to my old gal again boy and man i have followed the sea off and on this twenty year but i ain't had sich a near and a four i don't like to see a sight and i don't know any one as do if they say they do they lie there boy that's straight anyhow i mean them as go a fishin and smackin on the north sea it'll do middlin in summer but it cuts up rough in winter and little or much it's rough pretty generally us broadland folk many on us you know het to eke out a livin partly ashore and partly afloat lud's foller it up altogether spendin a few odd days ashore between times i go a heron catchin 
and spend the rest of the year ashore a farm labrin a fisherman's life bore is a harden and it ain't the weak uns as can stand it them as kin don't look any the worse but a sight the better art a leavin the plough tail a while and on the summit better livin for the briny piles up your appetite as well grow fat and kedgy or sprightly i were a sayin it blowed well the wind were fair and things looked promisin when the old tug gleaner chucked off the tow rope of the sea mew and we stood out to sea we was makin for the fishin grounds some miles to the north eastard the sun went down in an ugly sky but we didn't think as how things had changed for the wuss so quickly we had hardly got the nets shot and got turned in when the wind began to freshen the skipper didn't like the manner on it and his glass went back most curiously he gan the order to haul em in now tain't no easy job to haul in a mile and a quarter o heron nets stowin the bowls or floats and sich like specially when you're doin it in a hurry it were well we did it kedgy for it blowed most awful by the time we'd done it and got hove to under storm canvas you'd be surprised how soon the north sea turns up choppy we didn't feel particular uneasy as the good wessel dipped her bows and then rid over the tar and seas now she clom climbed the white fringed mountains and now she fell from their tops into the yawn and gulf below it were more awful than grand plunging along in the black night two on us kept watch the night was fearful long thinks i a basin of hot tea would do my innards good half drowned with the spray as flung itself aboard and stung and blinded with the hail i shouts into my mate's ear and tells him so and went down i'd hardly got below when we heard a terrific row on deck a sea broke over the wessel enough to bust her in two and we heard a shriek it were poor dick stevens's last cry in a moment he must have been carried overboard and been drowned i can hear that screech now poor dick he were a decent fella right into the mainsail the water poured heavin the sea mew down on to her beam ends and snappin the boom like a piece of stick we thought it was all up with us now poor the foresheet were carried away and the sail flapped madly in the wind somehow god only knows how she righted but the water had rushed down the hatchway and half filled her did we feel scared well if i say we didn't it'd be a lie but we didn't feel like giving it up while the wessel hung together we should ha looked a rum crew if yowed us in us some half dressed hatless and bootless just as we'd turned in with our work cut out i can tell ye cutting the boom clear for fear it had knock a hole in us and clearing away the mainsail we rigged up a jib and soon brought her head to wind some got to the pumps and right glad we was to hear them shout there she sucks for how could she face the heavy seas with her hold more than half full of water tired and jaded some on us went below again steadying ourselves as best we could as the wessel plunged and lurched some on us prying to him whose only son settled the gale on the sea of galilee and axin him to bless the wives and little uns as was worrying at home for dad a tossin on the ocean the hard horny hand brushes away a tear from the good fellow's weather-beaten cheek a awful crash on deck again made us hurry up the companionway and a terrible sight met our eyes many a ton of water had struck us 
the wessel were pretty well clean swept boat and everything gone barrin the mast and the rag of a sail and some of the bulwarks forward was knocked clean away well for old billy harden as he'd lashed hisself to the tiller or he'd a gone with em as it war he broke a rib or two and we had to carry him below i took the tiller prayin god to help me to do it while some hurried to set another jibsail we kept burnin flares but law who could help us every one else had enough to do to look after theirselves and then good heavens a wuss crash followed we'd been run into by another craft as were in wuss plight and ourselves it were the affair of a moment when a young feller god only knows how he managed it jumped clean off her into ours afore we could get on our feet again for we were all knocked down by the collision we lost sight o her she must a sank directly the poor chap said as she were the perseverance trawler waterlogged and in a sinking state all hands had been swept overboard except him and the mate who'd steered for us poor feller the mate had gone down with her we were now in wusser state than ever for we'd a big hole stove in the bows as let in any amount of water and it were only by keeping the pumps a goin we floated fortunately the storm lulled a bit and we ran afore the wind till we sighted caster burnin flares again we soon had the lifeboat arter us and them brave caster men god bless em took us off puttin as many as their own men aboard as could be spared and standin by her reachin yarmouth harbour with us with the wust of the gale over and the daylight a breakin eastard you know now what mischief were done and how many a brave feller never sailed into port again by the time our friend's yarn is ended we have drawn up at the broadland station and as our road lies in the self-same direction we continue to chat in a friendly sort of way until we reach his cottage standing in a well-kept little garden evidently he had been expected home for a trio of merry youngsters flinging wide open the somewhat rickety gate ran to meet him clustering round him as only loving children would and smothering his bronze face with kisses dad's home brings out the good man's wife who meets and welcomes him as one of the wives and mithers mess despairin only could what a marked difference there is in the outlook on the broads to-day the yachtsman has entirely deserted them and but for one or two boats containing couples of enthusiastic pike fishers we should have the solitudes to ourselves it is cold work at its best sitting or standing hour after hour throwing your live bait into likely spots where Aesox lucius may be lurking one need possess an abnormally strong constitution and will beside to follow it up successfully one angler yonder has a big fellow in hand how the maddened creature flurries and dashes in its terror eagerness and many another emotion are indexed on that flushed face as the fisherman gives and takes hopes that he may prove victorious in the struggle fears that the big fish will have his own way in the end and that look of triumph as he adroitly gaffs the tired-out monster is the most marked feature of them all and it is with justifiable pride he contemplates his huge quarry now lying at his feet and blesses the stout stubborn tackle and his right good luck which proved more than a match for the shark of our broadland waters 
a slight breeze ruffles the face of the cold-looking waters and rustles through the rush and reedy broad margins fluttering the dry leaves and rattling the equally dry stems into strange rustling music the reeds have not so much altered in general appearance yet as in colour a few of the lanceolate leaves have dropped and the feathery head tufts have assumed the wooliness that tells of a full age and a speedy dissolution on yonder tuft a couple of small brown birds are busily feeding the juvenile mollusks which in the sunny days crawled up their stems for a short siesta have gone below and the handsome bearded tits for such are they must perforce be thankful for a vegetarian dietary and so they are taking their fill of reed seeds they are merry creatures lively and musical even in winter making the reed bed ring with their clear flute-like ping ping unfortunately for the reed pheasant as the norfolkese call him the collector is always eager for a specimen of this indigenous bird of broadland who but for persecution and slaughter would remain with us all the year round if our fenmen should exterminate the native race it will become lost to us for we have no migrants of this species putting in an appearance in winter the time is gone for fifties to be seen together here what a host of birds we miss to-day not a reed warbler swallow martin or white-throat is seen the rattling notes of the common wren hunting in the alders and the chinking song of the redbreast have become familiar and the harsher cries of the berry feeding tedido of which the fieldfare and redwing are the most vociferous representatives are heard on every side where hedgerows trend there are some wild fowl on the broad they are apparently napping for their heads are snugly tucked under wing their small size unmistakably decides them to be teal a crested grebe disporting and fishing near by disturbs them they rearrange their already tidy plumage then playfully dodging each other for a moment take to wing and make for some other broad the grebes do not appear so plentiful as they have been on the approach of frost when the skaters will make their advent here they will have betaken themselves to the tidal estuaries where food may yet be had what big bird could it be that disturbed by our oar crackling in among the dry reeds now took to wing and with a sharp harsh cry hurried away we recognize in its brown mottled plumage and long thick rough neck that rare east anglian outlaw the common bittern now alas no longer deserving its distinctive title for by the draining of its native reed swamps and marshes to which it resorted in the breeding season they no longer afford it that secrecy and protection which seem so necessary to its perfect happiness jim trett or any of his kindred would have been delighted to have made so close an acquaintance with the bird as we have and to have levelled their fowling pieces at it bottle bump as the fenmen name it usually feeds at night and is extremely loth to take wing by day suspiciously eyeing intruders through the labyrinth of reeds and skulking off noiselessly at their approach we have been fortunate in seeing the fellow in his dull flagging kind of flight there are few small creatures that fly swim or crawl that bottle bump despises when downright hungry the last eggs of the bittern found in broadland were taken in the sixties 
we catch of course an occasional glimpse of coots and moorhens and pay scant heed to them or the snipe which frequently pass squeaking overhead some tufted ducks a couple of interesting shovelers and a red-throated diver seeking a change of diet of young roach severally engage our attention we push the boat up into a little sluice at the end of which a kind of dam has been banked up a rather large ditch on the other side is kept within bounds by a quaint skeleton-like drainage pump mill that throws its superfluous water into the broad we step ashore on the boggy soil and scramble up to take a closer inspection of the curious structure its machinery is simple the mill sails when at work whirl round as the winds play on them by a simple crank adjustment the box goes up and down now fast now slow as the rod is affected by the movement of the sails they are revolving but quite slowly now and for want of oil strange rasping and screeching noises emanate from the machinery in the water below it the aquatic plants reflect their broken and dishevelled remnants the sedges are crumpled and drooping not a little red or blue dot of a wild flower is there to relieve the dull monotony of coloration everything is brown and sere the only bright colours are the yellow willow leaves floating upon the surface the slight breeze gradually dies away the mill sails cease revolving stepping into the boat again lunch is brought to daylight and we sit down a while to enjoy it quietude has reassured whatever creatures may have skulked into safe hiding at our approach how unobservedly they vanish a dark brown bird wonderfully like the dead herbage that it skulks amongst glides into notice but for its movements we had not discerned it it is a water rail its sneaking habits are its safeguard and what fuss or ostentation is necessary when life's duties and necessities simply consist of capturing the snails slugs worms and aquatic plants on which it feeds its summer cry is a very odd croaking which the natives here call charming a crackling in the reeds attracts our attention on the right a huge animal that we at once know to be an otter forces his way through the reedy phalanx and is about to discuss the good qualities of a fine tench upon the very rond we have just stepped off his quick black eyes have caught our slightest movement and like a stone he drops into the water we secure that tench for it's as good for man as otter and the fellow can procure another far easier than we can this savours of appropriativeness poor fellow it's a sorry life he leads at the best for every man's hand is against him nobody has a word to say in his favour the very fish he devours are grudged him as if he were to be blamed for taking the poultry fish for his living why not rather blame those who for the sake of slaughter only haul out hundredweights to lie and rot upon the broadside however while the interminable reed bed exists so long will the otter in spite of persecution at least hold his own who can that be standing by the mill pump with an eel pick in his hand and beckoning us at first we fail to recognize him but his voice is unmistakable it's none other than jim trett the fenman we row back again 
he has been eel picking and his inverted bucket with a bottom where the top is usually located with his pick and his old fowling piece with his worthy self are soon aboard with us we have divined his wish to row back home with us and so to save his old legs some mile or two's tramping he has flung a brace of wild ducks and the woodcock in before him but why this alteration in his physiognomy well bore as you seem curious about it i may as well tell you the main and of it all last tuesday no bore let me be right on it it were the monday i went out with my old ape bore thinking to get a clip at a bunch of grey lag geese as were scoffing or eating the young wheat in a field up hinder to their heart's content now old woman i says afore lav in the house you'll have summat worth the bacon for dinner tomorrow or my name ain't what it are says she don't you tell or count your chickens afore you hatch em that's where i bait you i says cause they're geese and not chickens at all howsomdever i goes arter em and by dint of crawlin along a hole or dry ditch among nettles and brambles wadin through sluss or the mire and what not come up with the aisy gunshot now peggy says i do your duty and i claps her to my shoulder and pulls the trigger only a click she made i hadn't put a patch or cap on and if you will believe me i fumbled in every pocket and couldn't find one the geese hanes up their heads a wonderin but seein naught to be scared on went on feedin i could a hulled or thrown peggy in the hole howsomever thinks i i ha got a match here goes so putting my hand just under the trigger guard to steady her i poured a charge of powder over the nipple so as not to miss goin off if possible click went the match up jumped the flock or tried to as they bunched up peggy blazed into em settlin how many i didn't know for the powder as were on the gun and spilled in my hand bust up into my silly old face burnin off every hair as were on it and fairly blindin me but i got my buds four on em as soon as i come any way round at all ain't ain't i a lovely critter just now my old woman were finely scared i hope i shall get over the moot or molt by springtime as we row across the broad a dense fog which we have been anticipating settles over everywhere so that to steer homewards without mishap we skirt the reed bed making a detour much longer than necessary but as in walking in a fog so one may row and row and find oneself an hour hence at the very place started from now and again a gull looms up in the thickness appearing much larger than he really is like a grebe or two that we make closer acquaintance with than usual he shuns our society as soon as he recognises us as the fog seems likely to last some time we quit the broad and walk homewards with our discursive friend who has much to tell us this afternoon he is expected at farmer hobbs's with his ferrets rats have become more plentiful than welcome one curious incident happens near the landing stage a moorhen paddling round in search of food has attracted the hungry eyes of a big pike a splash and a whirl and the fisher's ugly head appears above water but a moment too late for the bird has taken to wing in the very nick of time on our way towards the village 
we pass a trio of farm hands watering their horses at the horse pond they have been at the plough we cannot help noticing the contrast in the gait of hodge whose life is entirely spent ashore long used to walking over ploughed and soft land he takes slow and lengthy lopes or strides with his shoulders forward and his awkward arms swinging in pendulum motion at his side his billycock hat canvas slop and fustian breeks tied with pieces of string below the knees complete his orthodox attire we venture to ask one brawny fellow why these knee cords for says he you'll follow the plough or work on the land where wet grass and rubbage sod or soak your trousers below just yell stoop without em being tied to and you'd bust off every button you'd on em it gi you freedom o movement boar and law we don't fail dressed without em the fisher broadman takes shorter strides rolls in his walk turns out his heavy elbows and somewhat reverses his hands his well-filled guernsey and heavy but less ungainly boots with the usual billycock completes his undress uniform the barber and he are on friendly terms for a moustache he resolutely refuses to wear he becomes altogether smarter in appearance manners and lingo than droning vegetating hodge but those brawny rotund shoulders and that portly figure mark the fisherman indelibly not that all grow fat having accepted an invitation to have a cup of tea in our fisher friend's house we drop in on our homeward way to the village station betimes finding the good man playing all sorts of capers with the youngsters who at times threaten to swamp him as he puts it the appearance of strangers curbs their rough play somewhat and without being rude exactly and a long way from being impudent they stare at us as we enter and they do stare to be sure these broadland children although the novelty of yachting and other folk are gadwadicking or tripping on the broads is wearing off there is a savoury smell of bloaters not those oak billet smoke delicacies from the fish house but fresh herrings or rather the least bit salted that have hung a day or two in the air to dry and season grilled over a clear wood fire they are exceedingly appetising and we are not long in falling to the homemade bread is in keeping with the herrings which we disintegrate with our fingers the fastidious spoil the flavour by using knife and fork hunches of bread disappear as if by magic all round the youngsters as well as we have prodigious appetites seven herrings disappear from between billy tungate our host's big brown fingers he too has an appetite the tea is black by name and appearance tungate's missus has been broken into boiling it in the old kettle and emptying the leaves only when there's no room to put more in then when full as the fisher folk do at sea she empties it so he tells us and makes a fresh start from the kettle bottom one broadland cottage is much like another both inside and out there is the same old-time red brick structure tinged with the greens and yellows of age the same honeysuckle or roses trained over the small paned windows and the martin's nest above the doorway a tiny flower garden runs before it to the palings with a hedge of holly or privet growing parallel 
the walls inside are whitewashed and a regiment of little cheap prints and family photographs are hung in anything but a methodical way upon them they have been tacked on as they turned up the brick floor is sanded the fireplace bright with lead and elbow grease everything is clean as wax from the youngsters ruddy faces fresh washed for dad to kiss them to the baby's little print dress for dad's home you know the homely repast having come to an end friend tungate gets down his long clay pipe draws from unknown fob depths his sealskin pouch of strong cheap shag and tempts us to share its contents the youngsters have each had their hug and kiss and their mother trots them off to bed but not to slumber yet for they have some arrears of fun to get over before they fall asleep when not a dean or sound will be heard not even a winnock or cry from the baby our good man grows chatty as the smoke curls upwards we may not place on record scarcely one fraction of his yarn which is of things fishy and of the sea that insurin of the herons is a wonderful thing bore so regular so enormous and in course so welcome some say they come to spawn perhaps they do but i have a notion as they come on the hunt for food as well what the herons eat well they eat wery small shrimps possum shrimps i hear the gents once call em small sea wormin and even a spawn and young of their own sort it's a rare godsend they're comin we fishin chaps muster up some thousands strong and man some four or five hundred boots a fishin boat all found without her nets costs suffin over a thousand pounds and her nets nearly half as much so it means some thousands of pounds a rollin don't it yo know at least i spose you do that a heron net's like a wall of meshes floated atop with corks kept straight down with its own weight a single boat drifts out some hundred and fifty nets each thirty yards long eleven yards deep some mile and a half that makes it we keep an eye on the gulls and will ducks or guillemots and the gants or gannets where they fish we know they're suffin shootin our nets at nightfall we hauls em early in the mornin it's a rare sight to see us haulin in thousands of silvery critters as have gilled theirselves a shovin to get clear of the nets the more they shove in course the tighter they get and drown theirselves they do to be sure we got over twenty last a couple of nights ago that's let me see how many a last is ten thousand reckon thirty two over for each hundred that's thirteen thousand two hundred i reckoned it up this morning at two hundred and sixty four thousand they fetch nine pound a last that weren't a bad bit of work gales and bad luck play the mischief up with us sometimes we get paid in proportion to our tax you know so much on the last or otherwise by the dole or share there's leaven on us from skipper to boy a good season and some may have to take forty or fifty pounds for their share which ain't bad seein as we fish from the end of july to christmas bad luck it is as spoils us when we make up in debt it's a lottery bore it are you've seen the fish wharf ain't you when the fishin's in full swing ain't it a sight to see the fleet of boats put in and out and the full heron swills or baskets spread a whole mile along the quayside and ain't we a rough unkempt lot in our cells and oilies or oilskins 
and faces unwashed for a week at a time just fancy a little heron ruling the lives of thousands merchants fishermen tellers or counters auctioneers coopers blacksmiths sailmakers ship carpenters and a hundred other sort of folks and thousands on em all getting more or less benefited by one little fish but in course the millions of em do it you've been in a fish house i suppose that's a rum sight seeing the carters fetchin the fish the hands a saltin washin spittin or runnin em on spits or sticks hangin kipperin packin labelin and what not ain't it a few hours hangin in the smoke room makes a heron into a yarmouth bloater and as many weeks as ours make ham curd reds of em and for a breakfast dainty give me one on em though for a matter of that didn't they make me dry i could manage half a dozen <laughs> much that relates to the habits and whims of the herrings their varieties the manoeuvres of the fishermen to outwit them much of the birds and marine monsters that prey upon them of humorous and pathetic incidents that brighten and sadden the fisherman's life is told us until the striking of the old dutch clock in the corner warns us that it is time to be off if we would catch our train a tap at the window brings us out quickly it is none other than our old friend trett who is off to the station with a trunk of eels i thought as you'd be here bor and as i've borrowed caleb Hewitt's pony and here's room for you well i don't see as how you'll need to walk we bid tungate good night trett puts the grey pony into an easy trot and away we go look here bor says he you've allers been good to me and the missus do take this here for your dinner to-morrow it'll please your missus and i know it will you i kilt a couple this morning down in the seven acre midder we dine at home next day on a fine fat bean goose and wish dear reader you could have dropped in upon us and have had a taste of its sweet juicy flesh end of chapter 11chapter 12 of man and nature on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain december in broadland o winter ruler of the inverted year thy scattered hair with sleet like ashes filled i love thee all unlovely as thou seemst and dreaded as thou art by thompson december on the whole is not a pleasant month it is generally ushered in with clouds and vapours and stormy days are not infrequent now and again towards its close the hoar-frost is scattered like ashes or a mantle of snow covers the landscape with whiteness on broadland there is an apparent cessation from outdoor labour the farmer has finished ploughing but the feeding and housing of his cattle demand attention whilst hodge jobs about as he expresses it for there is corn to be thrashed in the open weather and grain to be carted he will tell you that it don't do bor to fold your arms and not to keep a doin summer and master's very good that way in findin jobs for to do our old fenman friend finds scant idle time except when the waters are hard frizz reed cutting commences now there's hedging and ditching to do whilst up at the warren he finds it not unprofitable to help the warrener net rabbits for an adjacent market town 
and for this latter congenial adjunct his brace of ferrets comes in exceeding handy he finds them useful too in clearing the farmer's premises of rats not that he altogether exterminates them nor would he wish to if he could for winter'll come round again some day you know and what's the ferrets for this admission jim trett would not venture to make to any but a trusty friend it is a dull murky day with the promise of a change which cannot be for a much worse that finds us turning our backs upon the quiet broadland station we saw little to interest us coming along a number of white gulls on most friendly terms with their opposites in colour the rooks were foraging on a fresh ploughed field flocks of sober tinted larks rose up on either side as we startled them into hurried flight we might perhaps have observed more had we not become so absorbed in a gossip carried on by some substantial looking country wives who have been to town to purchase their christmas groceries it is simply astonishing how every one knows everybody else's business in these quiet villages we are treated to a sample of it amongst other analysis their intermarriages and family relationships are worked out in a genealogy as amusing as it is exhaustive none too pleasant is our walk broadwards the roads are veritable sloughs of despond and the unpleasant drizzle which has evolved from the thickening vapours driven by the wind filters through the leafless hedges as we plod along we speedily overtake a miserable object shambling along ahead of us and forcing our conversation upon him bit by bit draw from him the story of a misspent life and present destitution he once ran well but the strong drink hindered him it is the old story a goodly start pleasant prospects success temptation yielding gambling passions aroused excessive indulgence theft exposure then in quick succession followed hopelessness carelessness want and misery could it be possible that the unhappy rag-draped specimen of humanity rubbing shoulders against our own glad of but unprofiting by a word of sympathy was once in affluent circumstances and one whom the honourable at one time esteemed as one of them we study his bleared physiognomy thereon yet linger traces of refinement and education we query as to his wandering in such an outlandish country sir replies he what matters it to wretched cain whither he wanders so long as no one knows him so long as a crust is to be had for the asking and a public house is looming in the distance alas for poor humanity it is not sufficiently tempting to-day for us to venture out upon the open broad the rain has ceased and a streak of blue intervenes between the retreating rain cloud and a darker one which follows the wind still blusters but from the way the tell-tale on yonder mill-cap whirls round and strange harsh grating sounds proceed from part of the unoiled machinery we notice it is veering a point or two more northward a pelting hailstorm bursts upon us how keen the air is becoming sleet begins to mix with the lessening hailstones and there is the promise of snow in those mountainous clouds looming up from the horizon the sun breaks out a while and tinges the whole scene with a warm ruddy hue 
which is superseded by a colder yellow from a little brick broadland bridge we are content to take our survey of the broads here in their leisure moments in the finer days and on sundays between church times the natives delight to mardle resting their chins upon their folded arms on its parapets and here they love to ruminate we are not one whit better than they before us lies a broad with a white-edged ripple dancing upon its surface as the wind beats down it flinging the froth in amongst the stems of the bending reeds the breeze for a moment lulls and the yellow-brown reeds and rushes duplicate themselves in the depths decaying leaves and broken stems sprinkle the surface amongst them the debris of the water lilies the mare's tail and many another broad plant are rotting to form fresh soil below all around and about the broad signs of the year's decadence are apparent the old willow's slender twigs are bare and the beech's more distorted branches are as naked lichens are crowding the tree trunks only the fir trees in which the wood pigeons now resort at eventide bear the slightest resemblance to their summertime glories we miss the songs of the woodland birds the crack 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 of the moorhen is only heard at intervals the scolding of the crested grebes we listen for in vain most of them have gone to the milder southern counties a few may be found in winter in our open estuaries today but one or two have ventured to show themselves here they will be ready to visit salt water when the broad becomes clothed with an icy mantle we do not discern even a pike fisher today the only individual in keeping with our surroundings is a fenman cutting reeds we bring our glasses to bear upon him a plank pushed over the bows of his flat reed boat rests upon it and the stumps of those reeds already cut they easily support his weight the process is simple yet requires some judgment holding a bunch in his danoked or gloved left hand he makes a slightly upward sweep with his sickle cutting the reed stems as near the surface of the water as possible an axiom of the broadman says an inch a reed below waters wath two above it that from under water when dry becomes harder and more durable than that which grew above he lays them as cut athwart the boat until they form a little stack then quants with a shoving pole to the stave where he ties them up in bundles some six feet in circumference and sells them by the fathom when reeds were more in demand than now a reed bed formed a profitable adjunct to the owner's property and the fenman's earnings pains used to be taken in propagating them detached pieces of a reed bed were moored in likely places and a new growth speedily began now they encroach upon the broads all too fast extending their area year by year the bridge we stand on spans a narrow run of water and with the roadway trending on either side separates these two particular broads the runlet unites them turning round we take a survey of the other there is a sameness in the outlook only a grey church steeple breaks the distant line of trees and a tiny red flag marks the mooring place of a trading wherry a swampy rond with a narrow footpath insinuating itself into the labyrinth of alders 
tempts us to follow its windings the bog moss is growing rankly all else we tread on is dead and decaying water squeezes upwards at our every footstep and brambles catch our sleeves with their sturdy thorns the swamp is not untenanted a snipe and now another take to zigzag flight as we approach their hiding places and a long-billed bird which we recognize at once as a woodcock springs from under our very feet flies wildly and in an indefinite manner overhead and drops again as suddenly as he appeared turning abruptly to follow a less used pathway we come suddenly upon a sight which fills us with interest and with sadness depending from a low tree branch by pieces of twine are the numerous victims of a gamekeeper's vengeance stoats and weasels form the greater number we wonder not so much at this magpie condemned to death with some degree of fairness perhaps for the mischief he was believed guilty of that of egg-stealing but why this innocent barn owl we reckon up this gamekeeper as an ignorant unread and unthinking fellow some of the stoats are mere skins and skeletons for the blowfly was on his rambles when they were slaughtered and the shot holes thickly perforating their necks and shoulders are a guarantee of the accuracy of the keeper's aim some siskins are dodging about on an older stem but take to flight on the approach of a green woodpecker whose anticipations of an abundant meal hiding behind the decaying bark upon a willow bowl just beneath it are not far out we remain motionless as yet the fine bird with his yellow-green coat and crimson cap has not espied us at a snail's pace we bring the glasses to our eyes how the fellow is chipping the bark to splinters now he has exposed the trunk to view it is a grand time he is having amongst the armadillos that so unexpectedly brought to light are too stupefied to seek fresh shelter we reach the small red drainage pump its sails are not revolving a strange noise sounding very like the rushing of wind through the pump sails we instinctively imagine as such but an alarm cry as of a plover makes us suddenly look up it was not the wind but the rustle of a hundred pairs of wings and that cry was the wail of a golden plover they are migrating we observe no other birds except a dabchick disporting himself under an overhanging bank the wind suddenly springs up and flings in airy circles the descending snowflakes ere we reach the village the canopy of blackness which has been shutting out the blue above us is pouring forth its accumulation of snow it eddies and twirls around us in the blast which whisks up the flakes already fallen and drifts them under the hedgerows the first that fell have melted but the myriads following lie one upon the other and remain until all nature is covered with a pall of dazzling whiteness the bell in the village steeple is tolling ominously surely death has not been visiting broadland alas he has and the fair have fallen dong dong at short intervals reverberates from the ivy-clad steeple as the old sexton at measured periods tolls the passing bell he has left his spade resting against a moss-grown headstone that marks the last resting place where one of the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleeps yawning beside this is a freshly dug grave 
into which the spotless snow is gently falling as if to carpet the bare earth with unsullied purity there is a stir in the village apron-clad matrons are quietly hurrying to see the last of a little maiden whose burial takes place to-day some have donned all the black in their possession as a mark of respect for the departed they are making for the churchyard in the distance a solemn procession is wending its way hither also an old white pony is drawing its precious burden upon a cart over the coffin a velvet pall is spread snowflakes are falling lightly on it immediately behind follow the classmates of the dead maiden each with a snowdrop and a sprig of southernwood in her hand to throw directly upon the little coffin then follow the bereaved parents and their children and the friends of the family of whom muster a goodly number for half the village has turned out to pay homage to the little one gone to the land where there is no winter scarce a word is spoken and even then it is in subdued whispers the parson meets them at the church door with due solemnity and the procession files in slowly under the shelter of the old thatched roof two or three old men bent with age and leaning upon their sturdy staves bringing up the rear even they have a tiny slip of crape tied around the left arm the church service over the coffin is borne out and lowered into the open grave there is a strange feeling of awe displayed upon every feature as the soil drops with a thud upon the coffin lid and the quivering lips of the white-headed parson pronounce the well-known sentence earth to earth sobs are heard from relatives and sturdy fellows holding their broad-brimmed hats in one hand brush away a tear with the other brawny biceps now a sweet song is trilled by children's voices as they stand around the resting place of their lost companion brief life is here our portion brief sorrow short-lived care the life that knows no ending the tearless life is there by the time the song is ended there is not a dry eye in the company around even rough nixie lutkins the poacher and his sworn enemy the gamekeeper drawn by one bond of sympathy are now side by side looking over the low wall and are in tears for the time being old feuds are forgotten in the general sorrow poor little nelly goldstone was the only being who ever had a kind word for nixie maybe she being dead yet speaketh to him who knows but that even now he may be making up his mind to profit by the lesson of her spotless life the service finished and the last look taken the congregation slowly disperses and the sun peering out from behind the snow cloud that has passed over lights up the landscape and makes the countryside beautiful a fitting emblem of the brightness of a better world after a journey through the valley of the shadow of death winter now reigns supreme christmas the jolliest season of all the year is close upon us the town is unusually busy for everyone is making great preparations to welcome it even the hard work counterman puts up with its inconveniences with rest and pleasure in prospect there is an unusual bustle at the broadland station as we step out of our carriage and worm our way through a maze of hampers and baskets of good cheer the feet of fowls and the tails of game peep out in all directions is it not strange that much of our pleasure 
should depend on the death of the humbler creatures merrily ring the bells in the village steeple ding dong ding it is a sorry peal but the best the triplet of bells can do strong arms pull the ropes and the sound of their clanging is heard afar the drowsy bats among the rafters no doubt draw their heads from under their membranous wings and wonder at their strange awakening and the owls above them hiss and crouch at the farthest corner of their location ding dong ding let every one be glad for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given so runs the roughly painted scrollwork some village artist has proudly tacked around the old oaken pulpit there are lights twinkling in the church windows the parson and his helpers are making the church bright with evergreens befitting symbols of that name which endures through the generations it is not to the church we wend our way we are off to a supper at farmer carrison's a son is hum from the army one of his married gals is down from lunnon with her husband and it's a right merry time he intends a heaven and it is a right merry party we find sitting down in the spacious kitchen to a table creaking beneath the weight of the good things of this life kerrison welcomes us heartily and his company smile us a friendly greeting he himself saying us a complimentary so you've come more we could say much about the coquetries and gallantries of the younger farmhands and the curious bits of broad norfolk dispensed by the older ones but space forbids when grace is said we fall to with a gusto that bespeaks the quality of the spread and the appetites that will speedily devastate it first come norfolk dumplings we give them capitals for they are unique they are the simplest of puddings compounded of flour water yeast and a dash of salt boiled twenty minutes neither more nor less only norfolk matrons can make the legitimate article to see them knead and roll into shape between their hands nip off or add a pinch of dough is a sight that impresses you but to have them served up done to a nicety and swimming in gravy is an episode in your existence our friends stow away one apiece some of them more and then fall to a loin of pork that would make a bilious man stand aghast with it disappear turnips and potatoes next follows toad in the hole pork sausages baked in batter this fails to upset or satisfy then comes pork and apple pie with a crust as thick as a policeman's boot sole then pumpkin and apple pie and those who wish it may have their turn at rice pudding and giant custards lastly comes a monster plum pudding of which strange to say but sorry fragments afterwards find themselves upon the kitchen table all this time there has been much uncorking of non-intoxicants and the ale barrel has been running itself dry as well we bid the party good night ere the evening's fun commences which finishes with a merry dance and light refreshments strolling along in the cold crisp air we wander broadwards for the last time in the old year the frost dust sparkles in the moonlight a slight rime has touched the tree branches and the hedges with whiteness the broad is frozen over we hear no sounds but the crackling of the ice and the occasional cry of some awakened bird 
once we notice the murmur of starlings roosting in the reed bed then all is quiet again the report of a gun rings through the clear night air it is a suspicious sound and we doubt not some poacher is out on the prowl presently a figure emerges from a small wood ahead of us but as if our presence is simultaneously detected it disappears again once again the man as if reassured of our neutrality steps out from a nearer thicket and staring inquisitively at us recognizes us it is nixie lutkins at his old game again we had hoped better of him and we venture to tell him so ah bore what's bred in the bone or work itself out somewhere he replies a feller can't help his instincts why when i were only a nipper the sound of a shot had just made me all excitement and it is only with a gun in my hands that i am happy now in spite of all that's brought me i can't part myself from it and why shouldn't i have some fun in life jest as well as a rich uns they abuse us for destroying a few head of game they can kill em by the hundred what feeds their buds but the farmer's corn and he doesn't open his mouth to say so their buds <laughs> ain't them pheasants and partridges on one man's field to-day and on another's to-morrow them as they belong to why didn't they mark em could any on em swear to a bard and say as sich and sich a one were their own particular property if they're theirs says i why didn't they keep em at home well i may be wrong but i like the fun and excitement the sight of a long-tailed un asleep on a tree branch sets me all afire all right governor you don't need to feel uneasy true a man's known by the company he keeps but do go see as we shan't be overlooked he whistles and a scraggy but faithful lurcher which has been till now in hiding glides up to and takes its place behind him you will keep sentry ain't you duke the dog answers by lifting a paw and wagging its tail in a cautious manner talk about dogs dukes as knowin some as must he never sells hisself by bargain he can trace and bring in a hare like a christian and he never recognised me in company and will even pass me in the street as if we were the biggest strangers for he can tell mischief a brewin afore i can ah bor i have had some rare doos in my time let me light my pipe and i'll tell you of one or two i once made a good haul on yin island it were this wise i knowed as how a lot of long tails were roostin in there at nights for i'd seen em flyin over at even time they were snug like there weren't no stoats nor rats or sich like to worry em lor it were tantalizin to see em whizzin over the bit of water and turnin in all serene one night i watched the keeper off the beat and slippin my old gun where she now is see i got her here half in each pocket i nips down to the broad there weren't much moon but just enough to distinguish this from that the broad were hard frizz and snow lay thick my footmarks had tell a tale so i jest off with my boots and stockings and reverses em stocks outside you know then i wrap some rushes round em you wouldn't ha known my tracks from a elephant's there they were snoozin in the trees i pops over a dozen right quick and off i come i hops ashore strike off across some fields 
Megan most of my way across tangled places and aside the halls, and makes for home. I found old Cubit Sticky wandering in a lane. On him I jumped, making him trot me the remainder of my journey. To bustle him off with a kick or two as he'll remember to his dying day, to hang my bards in the chimbley, pop in the bed, and to get snoring with a work of a few minutes. And none too soon neither, for I'd hardly done it afore I heard the slop, or policeman, and keepers come in. In course upstairs they all stumped, where I were a-snoring like a hippopotamus. Says the bobby, this here is a rum do. Nixie's at hum and fast asleep. It weren't him. Tis a rummin, says a keeper. We don't need to wake him. And once more, clappin' the bull's eye on to me, they hooks it. However, to keep from bustin' with laughin', I don't know. And they hadn't cleared the house door afore I busts. Hello, says one, what's that? And I suppose he listens. Then he says, I suppose that's the cat a wailin. Just then the cat do trot downstairs, and that settles their opinions. They couldn't prove nothin, but give a dog a bad name and hang him, so they say. The wust a wrong doin is that one thing leads to another. If a feller don't lie outright to hide his tricks, he had to act full many a one to screen em, and he's so tempted to act mean as well. I ha used false whiskers, makin myself look like other folk, and once I slipped on a shepherd's coat. I were traced, but got away, but poor old Barney Hewitt got run in cause they knowed his coat. It were only my owning up to the poaching as saved him a fortnight on the staircase, for they found a couple of pheasants in the pockets when I dropped it. Mind you, I never showed fight. I value my neck too well. No, if I'm copped or taken, I'm copped. If I ain't, I gets away. That's logic, ain't it? Says I, never prop up a rotten beam with a worm-eaten bit of timber. Once I got away when I were took. Duke and I was out one evening on the old game. We'd got a hare. That were a four hares were chalked as wormin. We heard footsteps, and with no more ado, we draws ourselves into a heap of rubbish, hedge clippings, briars, brakes, and such like, and covered ourselves serene. That dog didn't make a dean or sound. The keepers were arter us. One on em actually stamped on Duke's foot as he passed by, but the old feller didn't even wince. I felt his breath come quick and sharp agin my face. They passed on. Sendin' Duke home, for I knowed they'd leave no stone unturned to get me. I hides my old piece beneath a heap of hay. She were rusty enough when I fetched her again, and makes for the village pub. They were there afore me. In a moment, the slop, who'd been called in to help, had the snips or handcuffs on me, and out I had to go. They thought they'd got their bird, but they hadn't. Handcuffed as I wore, I bolted. They dashin' arter me. I could run then, and for a while outdistanced them. Presently, I trips agin a stern, and comes down wallop. Luck, however, were on my side, for one other links were brook. Law, how I pegged it! Well, boy, they lost all traces of me, and by a roundabout way, I gets into a barn unbeknown to em, and hides beneath the straw. I'd a knife in my pocket, and by dint of sawin, by next noontime I had my hands free altogether. I got fearful hungry, but thought it best to hide till nightfall. 
then i goes round a mile or so to my brother's he were a hawker and put his brooms and pails and dwiles or housecloths and cetera in a box built behind like i begs him to see me hum so arter a feed he pops me in hid fust and puttin the pony in off he trots lor that were a ride if you like i had no end of bunnies or lumps on my head when we got to the house once when the pony draws into the hoss pond i just about stands upon it i wondered what were up arrived at the house he jerks open the door and shoots me in like a bale of goods i were laid up with a low fever for some weeks arter that and in the meantime the affair blowed over just now duke shows signs of uneasiness and his master takes the hint but before he leaves us he hurriedly remarks that he really intends to drop the business bore he adds that ere little un as were buried t'other day begged on me to do different and s'help me some day i mean to but it's hard to give up the old ways perhaps in the new year i'll turn over a new leaf but i must have my christmas dinner fust good night sir the fellow as suddenly vanishes as he appeared we continue our musings on the bridge alone the keeper for he it is whose oncoming has put the poacher to flight accosts us and makes comment on the beauty of the night feelings of delicacy on his part forbid him interrogating us as to whether we'd heard or seen anything in his way ding dong ding again peal forth the village bells their clear mellow tones ringing out through the bright quiet night there is something weird and beautiful in their clanging yet so strange withal now for a while they cease and the music of sweet childish voices is borne along upon the breath of the gentle wind a welcome as appropriate as it is touching of the day that we love best in the days of the year bringing to mind the beautiful and never tiresome story of the nativity of him whose praises the angels sang at bethlehem and his presence seems so real and near to us that unconsciously we take off our hat and the place whereon we stand seems hallowed ground reader it is time for us to take leave of each other can we do better than part at the manger where the holy child lay our broadland jaunts have come to an end End of chapter 12 End of Man and Nature on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson